My name's Ray, and this started back in 1996. Trucking business is all I've ever known. Learned to drive at my daddy's knee. Been hauling up and down the East Coast ever since I got my license. Seen plenty of weird stuff over the years, but nothing like this. That summer, I was running a regular route hauling textiles from North Carolina up to Connecticut. Easy gig, good pay. Until the night it all went sideways. I was cutting through a stretch of West Virginia backroads, trying to make up some time. It was late, past midnight, and the rain was coming down hard. My old rig was rattling something fierce, and I was starting to get that nervous feeling you get when you've been pushing yourself too long. Should have stopped, gotten a room for a few hours. But I was close to my destination, and stubborn as a mule. Figured I could power through. That's when I saw it. A figure standing on the side of the road. Tall, and possibly tall, and thin as a beanpole. It was huddled under a tattered umbrella, dressed in a long black coat that hung limp in the rain. I couldn't see its face, but something about it made every hair on my neck stand up. Common sense told me to keep driving. But something stronger, something I couldn't explain, made me slow down and pull over. The figure turned its head as I approached. I still couldn't make out its face, but my stomach churned. It looked wrong somehow. The figure lifted a long, pale hand and beckoned me closer. Every instinct screamed at me to get the hell out of there. I should have listened. Instead, I cracked my window, voice shaking a bit. You need help? The figure didn't answer. Just tilted its head to one side, like it was confused. The rain dripped down its two long fingers, pooling on the asphalt. Suddenly, the headlights of my truck flickered and died. Hey! What the dash? I fumbled with the switch, but the engine just sputtered complete blackout. Something slammed into the passenger side window, hard enough to crack the glass. I screamed and flung myself across the seat. Then I saw it. The figure was pressed against the window, peering in. In that brief flash of light, I got a real good look at it. And my blood froze. It wasn't human. It had a face of sorts but it was twisted and misshapen. The skin was a sickly gray, stretched tight over bones that seemed too long, too sharp. But it was the eyes that got me. Empty, black sockets, like it had no soul. The creature's mouth stretched into a horrible grin, revealing rows of needle-like teeth. It raked its long nails down the glass. I was trapped, a terrified animal in a cage. I must have blacked out, because the next thing I remember is the sun coming up and the rain stopped. My truck was still running, but the window on the passenger side was shattered. I stumbled out, half expecting the creature to be lurking in the trees. But there was nothing. Just the empty road and the birds singing. I reported the incident, of course. Cops looked at me like I was either drunk or a damn lunatic. Figured I swerved to miss an animal, panicked, smashed my own window, and hallucinated the rest. Maybe they were right. Maybe I was cracking under the stress. But I know what I saw. For a while I tried to forget. Stuck to main highways, lit up like Times Square at night. But bills don't pay themselves. Eventually, I had to take those back roads again. Every time, I kept expecting to see that tall, gaunt figure waiting in the shadows. It never was, but that didn't make the fear go away. The worst part is, I started noticing the disappearances. Other truckers vanishing on those lonely stretches of highway. Rig found abandoned, driver nowhere to be seen. Never made the national news just whispers in the truck stops and online forums. One night, 
at a greasy diner in Kentucky, I got talking to an older trucker named Wyatt. He'd been hauling for decades, seen it all, so I figured I could trust him. I told him about the creature, everything. Wyatt didn't laugh. Just nodded and stared into his coffee. Finally, he spoke. There are things out there in the dark places, son. Things older than highways, older than our granddaddies. Most folk never see em. Count yourself lucky, leastways so far. Lucky? I choked out a laugh, and it came out bitter. Wyatt took a long drag of his cigarette. Thing is, sometimes they take a shine to you. Mark you? Could be your good hunting. Could be you remind them of something, some old dead ode. Don't matter none. Point is, chances are, you ain't seen the last of that tall fella. He was right. In the years since, I've spotted the creature a few more times. A flicker in the trees as I drive by, a shadow slipping away as I pull into a rest stop. It's never gotten close again, but I feel its eyes on me, cold as death. Waiting. My name's Marcus, and this happened to me back in 2011. They say trucking gets in your blood. Well, I got my share young. My dad drove long haul his whole life, and most of my summer vacations were spent riding shotgun in his old rig. I couldn't wait to get behind the wheel myself. That fall, I landed a cross-country run, hauling supplies from the California coast out to Tennessee. Figured it was a good gig for a newbie. The weather's decent. The highways are wide. It all went smooth for the first few days. Then I got rerouted. Some kind of accident closed the major interstate near Oklahoma City. My dispatcher told me to take a detour, cut through a stretch of back roads I'd never heard of. I wasn't thrilled, but it's not like we drivers get much choice in our routes. The road was narrow, winding through rolling hills dotted with scraggly pines. The sun was going down, painting the sky orange and pink. Should have been pretty, but something about the place set my teeth on edge. It felt lonely. And not just the regular empty highway lonely, but something older, deeper. It was full dark by the time I hit a little town called Red Creek. I figured I'd stop there for the night, grab some food, maybe a motel room. The first few places, gas station, diner, a little motel, were all boarded up like the whole town had just gone and died. I was about to give up when I saw a flickering neon sign further down the main street. Saloon rooms hot meals. Pulling up outside, I didn't see much cause for optimism. The place had that rundown, end-of-the-line look that screams bad decisions. But by then I was tired, hungry, and that hot meal was starting to sound real good. So, I pushed through the creaking door and stepped inside. The saloon was dim and smoky. A few locals hunched at the battered bar, nursing beers and giving me sidelong glances. Took a seat in a shadowed booth trying to blend in. A waitress shuffled over, looking half asleep. Her name tag read, Mabel. What can I get ya? She mumbled, without even a glance at a menu. Burger, I said. Fries and whatever beer you'd recommend. She nodded, wrote it down on a scrap of greasy paper, then drifted back behind the bar. I surveyed the room again trying to shake the feeling of being watched. The other patrons had lost interest in me, at least. Mabel brought my food. It looked as bad as I'd feared, but after that long day in the cab, my stomach overruled my brain. As I was chewing a particularly sad piece of burger, Mabel came back over and slid onto the bench across from me. You ain't from around here, she said. 
It wasn't a question. Just passing through. I confirmed. Detour and all that. Mabel gave me a knowing look. That road ain't good. Not after dark. I shrugged. Didn't have much choice. You seen him yet? Her voice dropped low. Seen who? I asked, confused. Mabel leaned in closer, her eyes wide and serious. The tall man. He walks that road at night. Hunts the unwary. I chuckled. Is that some kind of local ghost story? Mabel shook her head, her mouth set in a thin line. He ain't no ghost. Leastways, not like you think. But he's real enough. And them that sees him, well, they don't tend to last long. The hairs on the back of my neck prickled. Mabel wasn't messing with me. I could see that in her eyes. She was genuinely scared. But of what? Just as I opened my mouth to ask, a figure stepped through the doorway, silhouetted against the streetlights. Tall. Unnaturally tall, with limbs that looked too long, like an old scarecrow in a worn-out suit. He crossed the room with slow, deliberate steps, and a chill ran through me. He settled at the bar, hunched on a stool a couple seats down from the locals. They all flinched away subtly. Even Mabel turned white as she poured his drink. The tall man didn't turn his head, but I felt his gaze on me. He didn't need to. The whole room buzzed with the tension of a trapped animal under a predator's eye. I had to get out of there. I pushed a few crumpled bills onto the table and stood. My legs felt shaky as I headed for the door. I heard the tall man slide off his stool. The locals at the bar tensed. My first instinct was to run, but something stronger held me back. Can't go through life running from every shadow, every weird story, can you? Come on, Marcus, I muttered to myself, forcing my steps to be normal. But with every footfall, I felt the distance between us shrinking. Just before I reached the door, I heard him speak. It wasn't a voice, more like a dry rasp, a whisper of dead leaves. Leaving so soon? I couldn't help it. I turned. The tall man stood directly in my path. Up close, he was even more unsettling. He wasn't just tall. His limbs were disproportionate, the angles all wrong. His face, in the dim light it just looked like a blur of shadow, but there was a gleam from within, like oil reflecting moonlight. I had the gut-clenching certainty that those weren't eyes but something far more alien looking back at me. One of the locals, a grizzled old trucker, was on his feet. Leave the boy alone, he growled, surprisingly courageous considering how scared he looked a moment ago. The tall man's head tilted slightly. This one is mine. Then, with a speed that defied his ungainly shape, his hand shot out. His fingers were long and skeletal, tipped with claws rather than nails. They raked across the old trucker's face, leaving deep, bloody furrows. The man screamed, collapsing to the floor. Chaos broke out. The remaining patrons scrambled for the door, knocking over chairs, shoving past Mabel, who stood rooted to the spot, staring at the scene in horror. I was frozen too, not out of fear, but some kind of horrible fascination. The tall man turned his attention fully on me. He took a step closer than another. I could smell him now, a rotting, earthy stench that made my stomach heave. He reached out again, those horrifying claws inches from my face. And that's when my survival instinct kicked in. I ducked, spun, and kicked out at his knee as hard as I could. It felt like kicking a tree trunk, but there was a jarring crunch, and the tall man stumbled with a guttural hiss of pain. I didn't look back. I bolted out the door, lungs burning, 
heart hammering a frantic rhythm against my ribs. The night air was clean and cool, a desperately needed contrast to the suffocating tension of the saloon. I didn't stop running until I was out of the town, the flickering lights and tumble-down buildings swallowed by the darkness. Only then did I dare to slow down, gasping for breath. What the hell had just happened? Was Mabel right? Was there really something monstrous out there in the hills, preying on lonely travelers? Or was this all some kind of sick, twisted trick, the whole town in on it? I looked back down the way I'd come, half expecting to see the tall man's impossible figure loping after me. Nothing but the empty road. I spent the rest of the night under an overpass, huddled in my cab, too terrified to sleep. The old trucker's screams echoed in my head. Finally, at first light, I started driving again, pushing eastward as fast as my rig would go. Never reported it to the cops. Figured either they'd lock me up in the psych ward, or I'd end up a missing person statistic myself. Maybe Mabel and the locals would clean up the mess, keep their deadly secret under wraps. In the months that followed, I stuck to busy interstates and well-lit truck stops. Took on a driving partner, a burly ex-marine named Duane, for safety in numbers. Still, every time I saw a tall figure out of the corner of my eye, my heart would skip a beat. Every creak of the rig at night made me jump. The news report started about a year later. Truckers disappearing on lonely stretches of road, especially around Oklahoma and Arkansas. Vehicles found abandoned, no sign of the drivers. The papers chalked it up to highway robbery, drug deals gone bad, the usual. But I knew better. I knew that the tall man was still out there, collecting his toll in blood and fear. One night... At a truck stop diner in Tennessee, an older guy with a faded USMC tattoo on his forearm started chatting with me. Turns out, he was from Oklahoma, and his cousin, a trucker, had done one of those disappearing acts the year prior. Strange thing is, he said, a haunted look in his eyes, they found his truck all tore up. Like something big fought him inside the cab. Never did find no body, though. Just, just some blood. His voice trailed off, and he stared at his coffee cup in silence. I drove all the way back to California nonstop after that. Quit that route, got a local gig to try and convince myself a normal life was still possible. It wasn't. Not anymore. I started drinking, stopped calling my wife and slept with my shotgun propped by the bed. Lost that job, then the next, and the next. My wife left, taking our daughter with her. Can't say I blame her. I've become a ghost of the man she married, haunted by a thing the rest of the world doesn't believe in. Sometimes I wonder if it would be better if I'd never kicked the tall man in that dusty saloon, let him have me, avoided turning into this shadow-jumping wreck. The worst part is, I know he's still out there. I know it's only a matter of time before our paths cross again. And next time, I doubt I'll get away. My name's Frank and this happened to me back in 2009. Been trucking for as long as I can remember. My dad taught me to drive an 18-wheeler before I had a car license. Guess you could say I was born for the road, and I love it most days. But there are nights, nights that remind you the highway ain't always meant for humans. That spring, I was hauling a load of electronics down to Texas. Long trip so I broke it up into two days, planning to spend the night somewhere in the Oklahoma panhandle. Had this old rig back then, real temperamental, always threatening to break down. And wouldn't you know it, as I was crossing the state line, 
the engine started sputtering and coughing like it had a death wish. It was already full dark, no towns in sight for miles, only those flat, empty plains stretching out all around. I cussed the blue streak, but managed to roll the rig to a stop on the shoulder. Popped the hood. Didn't see anything obviously wrong, but I know engines about as well as I know brain surgery. Figured I'd best call for roadside assistance and try to find shelter for the night. Cell service was spotty in those parts, but I eventually got a signal. The tow truck would be ours. As I settled in to wait, a flicker of movement out on the road caught my eye. Under the pale moonlight, I saw a figure walking slowly toward me. My first thought was relief. Maybe they could help me figure out the engine trouble. But then I noticed how the figure moved. There was something wrong about it. Each step was unnaturally long, the arms swaying loosely. As it got closer, the light from my rig reflected off its skin, a sickening grayish hue. Its head turned toward me, and even in the darkness, I could see the glint of eyes that weren't quite human. Panic flared. Should have gone with my gut and floored it while I could, but instead my brain froze. Just sat there, trapped behind the wheel. The figure reached my window. It stood so tall its head almost brushed the roof. Its face. It wasn't masked or deformed, exactly. Just subtly wrong, the proportions somehow twisted and off-kilter. Worse than that, it was blank. No anger, no curiosity, just an empty stare that sent chills down my spine. I smelled a faint odor, like rotting leaves and wet earth. The creature lifted a hand, and possibly long, bony fingers ending in dirty, curved nails. It tapped the glass. Not hard, more like it was testing the surface. My mouth had gone dry. I wanted to scream, to gun the engine and try to run it over, but all I could do was stare back at that hideous face. Then, as suddenly as it came, the figure turned and walked back into the darkness. I snapped out of it, fumbling for the keys. The engine roared to life on the first try, like it had never had a problem in the first place. I floored it, not caring where I was going as long as it was away from that thing. I pulled into the first town I saw, lights blurring with tears I was too proud to fully shed. Never could explain it to the police. Even saying it out loud to myself, it sounded crazy. But I saw what I saw. After that, I stuck close to big cities. Took daytime runs. The trucking company thought I'd finally cracked under the strain of too many nights alone on the road. Maybe they were right, in a way. I wasn't sleeping. Couldn't eat. Every time I did drift off, I'd dream about that blank in human face pressed to my truck window. My wife noticed, of course, tried to help, but how could I explain? Eventually, she left. Can't blame her. A few years later, I started hearing whispers from other long haulers. Truck found abandoned on some desolate stretch, the driver gone without a trace. Or one of us would vanish from a rest stop in the middle of the night, leaving a half-eaten sandwich and the engine running. We didn't talk about it much, especially not to outsiders, for fear of ending up in the funny farm. But we all knew. We all had our own versions of the creature lurking back in our nightmares. The news called it. The highway hunter, trying to spin some urban legend crap. But there's nothing ghost-like about this thing. It's flesh and blood, even if it doesn't move or look like anything born of this earth. Sometimes I wonder if it's even a single creature. Maybe there's a bunch of them spread out across those lonely backroads, all hunched over, those blank eyes staring into the headlights of passing trucks, looking for their next victim. I gave up on trucking soon after, but that didn't help. 
It just felt like leaving the front lines of a war knowing nothing's changed. The enemy is just going to pick off someone else. Now, I've got a tiny apartment in the middle of downtown Chicago, surrounded by noise and crowds and blessedly bright lights at all hours. Sleep still doesn't come easy. I lock my windows, even ten floors up, and jump at every shadow on the street below. Most nights, I dream I'm back behind the wheel, barreling down a deserted highway always toward a looming figure with glowing eyes at the edge of the darkness. My name is Harlan, and this happened to me in July of 1998, when I was a truck driver. I'd been doing long hauls for over a decade then. It was a life I liked. Sure, the hours were crazy, the pay wasn't great, but being behind the wheel, seeing the country unfold, there was a kind of freedom to it that suited me well. My usual route back then snaked from the Midwest to the West Coast. I liked the run, predictable, good diners dotted along the way, some decent stretches of wide open road, you get used to the rhythm of it. Except that time, something was different. It started in Nebraska, of all places. I'd pulled in at a rest stop just off I-80. The air was heavy and hot, the asphalt simmering. It wasn't even noon, but I was already fighting off a wave of exhaustion. I figured a quick walk around and a strong coffee would do the trick. I headed for the back of the lot where it was less crowded hoping to avoid a bunch of noisy kids and restless families. That's when I saw it. Parked against the low scrub at the edge of the lot was a beat-up old camper van. Rust blotches streaked the side, and a cracked rear window was crudely patched with duct tape. It looked abandoned, and my first instinct was to keep my distance. But then I caught a flicker of movement in the side mirror. Not much, just a shadow, but enough to spark a prickle of unease. I kept my gaze forward, but I could still sense the van in my peripheral vision. Curiosity, and maybe a dash of stubbornness, won out. I changed course, heading towards the van instead of the rest area. I wanted to satisfy myself it was empty, and then be on my way. I came around the back and that's when I saw the blood. It wasn't a lot, just a smear of crimson on the faded paint just below the side window. My stomach lurched. I took a step closer, my breath hitching. Inside the van, a figure was slumped over a small, rickety table. Flies buzzed lazily against the window, and the sickly sweet smell of decay was unmistakable. I don't remember the exact moment I decided to call the police. It was like a switch had flipped in my brain. The freedom of the open road suddenly felt stifling, replaced by a suffocating sense of dread. Adrenaline spiked in my veins, making my pulse race. I backed away from the van slowly, eyes never leaving that shadowy figure hunched inside. The local cops came surprisingly fast. Within the hour, the rest stop was crawling with activity. I gave my statement, watching stony-faced officers cordon off the van. I could feel their unspoken judgment, the question in their eyes, why didn't you report it immediately? The answer was, I didn't know myself. A mix of morbid fascination and disbelief, maybe? But now, the shock was wearing off replaced by a sense of guilt and self-recrimination. They hauled the van away that afternoon. News reports trickled out later. The body was badly decomposed, and it was a man, but establishing an identity proved impossible. No missing persons reports in the area matched his description. No stolen vehicle notices corresponded to the van. It was like both man and vehicle had materialized from thin air, only to leave a smudge of blood as evidence they were ever there. 
I wrestled with the incident for weeks afterward. What if I'd looked closer right away? Could the man have been saved if I hadn't hesitated those few minutes? The what-ifs became a loop inside my head, a constant, nagging reminder of a stranger's death. But my run waited for no one. I got back on the road, the familiar miles a feeble attempt at outrunning my lingering unease. It was out west, somewhere in the arid loneliness of Nevada, that I saw the camper van again. I was nearing one of those no-name towns you blink and miss if you aren't careful. My eighteen-wheeler roared through the sun-baked landscape, then I caught sight of a dirt turn-off leading back into a low stand of trees. And there was the van parked as if waiting under the meager shade. A wave of heat washed over me, mingled with a jolt of pure fear. My hands tightened on the steering wheel. No way. It couldn't be the same van. It had to be a trick of the relentless desert sun. I eased off the gas, debating. Logic said turn the rig around, get the hell away, report it. But some twisted, stubborn part of me whispered, This time you do something. I pulled over onto the cracked shoulder of the highway, the dust churning in my wake. My heart hammered against my ribs as I climbed out of the cab, squinting against the harsh light. With a determination born of anger and something like morbid curiosity, I began to walk towards the van. As I got closer... I knew without a shadow of a doubt it was the same one. Every rusted detail was seared into my memory. The duct-taped window, the peeling paintwork, even the smear of blood I'd seen weeks earlier. My stomach roiled. Someone had been playing a sick joke, moving the van around, taunting me, or was there something far more sinister going on? The van door swung open before I could reach it. I jumped back, expecting to see. I don't know what I expected, but there was no one inside. The interior of the van was filthy, piled high with tattered clothes and empty food wrappers. I stepped cautiously up into the gloom, the stench of rot making me gag. An empty whiskey bottle rolled under my boot. At the back of the van, a tattered sleeping bag lay crumbled on the floor. I nudged it with my foot, half dreading what might lie beneath. It was empty. I swore under my breath. Of course it was. Had I really expected to find a corpse twice? I was turning to leave when a scrap of paper, tucked under the edge of the sleeping bag, caught my eye. Curious, I pulled it free. It was a crudely drawn map, the paper stained and smudged. My eyes scanned it, picking out familiar highway lines, rest stop names. It was a route map, and along its length were a series of crude X marks. The hair on the back of my neck prickled. These weren't random locations. They were places where I'd stopped along my route. Someone had been tracking me. For weeks, possibly longer. I thought back to that day in Nebraska the blood on the van, the unseen figure. Panic flared like a wildfire in my chest. This wasn't just some morbid prank. I scrambled out of the van, snatching a final glance at the map. The last X marked the spot where I was standing. I fled back toward my truck, the desert landscape swirling around me. Every shadow seemed to hold a threat. Every sound was a footfall behind me. Sweat drenched me, my breath rasped in my throat. I fumbled the keys into the ignition, the engine roaring to life with a deafening clatter. I threw the rig into gear, gravel spraying from the tires. I needed the police, or maybe someone, anyone. I just needed to get away. For months, I drove in a state of near-constant terror. I jumped at the sight of every van, saw the flash of duct tape in every reflection. The map haunted me. Who had drawn it? Were they watching even now? Was I the next X? 
Sleep became a luxury I could rarely afford, my body fueled by truck stop coffee and adrenaline. Then came the news reports. It started in Wyoming. A body turned up beside a highway, just off some nowhere exit. Then there was another in Colorado, then California. All male, all seemingly random. Yet I couldn't get the image of that map out of my head. Was this connected? Were those X marks? I didn't even want to think it. When the authorities released a sketch of a potential suspect seen near one of the sites, a chill ran through my entire body. The drawing was rough, but I'd seen that man. He was the figure I'd glimpsed in the van window that day in Nebraska. The same man, blurry and indistinct, but the same hulking frame, the same ragged clothes. My name is Brooks, and this happened to me in the fall of 2008. I was a long-haul trucker then, crisscrossing the country with whatever loads needed hauling. It was a life I liked, the open road, the solitude, though it got lonely sometimes. I'm a single guy, been on my own for as long as I can remember. But hey, at least I didn't have a nagging wife to complain about my long hours, right? That year, my regular route took me through the southwest. Arizona, New Mexico, a touch of Texas, wide open landscapes and dusty towns that all blurred together after a while. I'd gotten into the rhythm of it. Long drives, greasy diners, nights at those chain motels with the flickering neon signs. It was on a stretch of I-10 outside of El Paso that I saw her. A young woman, barely more than a girl really, hitchhiking on the shoulder. The desert sun beat down mercilessly, and she looked about ready to wilt where she stood. I don't usually pick up hitchhikers. There's company policy against it, and besides, you never know who you might be giving a ride to. But this girl, she seemed harmless. I pulled over. She threw her backpack onto the passenger seat, a grateful smile lighting up her face. Thanks, mister, you're a lifesaver. Name's Lara. She had a soft voice and big brown eyes that held a vulnerability that tugged at something inside me. Elara told me her story as we rolled down the highway. She'd been heading out to California, chasing some big dreams about making it in Hollywood. Typical runaway story, a dime a dozen. Only, her ride had fallen through somewhere in West Texas, leaving her stranded. We fell into a kind of comfortable rhythm, me listening, her talking. She had an infectious sort of energy, a wide-eyed optimism that was hard not to be a little charmed by. We parted ways when I turned off at a truck stop outside of Lordsburg. I figured it was a little town, she'd have better luck catching another ride. I watched her walk down the ramp, and for an irrational moment, I regretted not offering to take her further. The next evening I was loading up at a warehouse on the outskirts of Phoenix. It was already dark, the loading dock buzzing with activity. The warehouse foreman walked toward me, clipboard in hand, and that's when I saw her again. Elara stood behind him dressed in a worn blue coverall that hung too big on her slight frame. She caught my eye, and a flash of surprise registered on her face, quickly replaced by a shy smile. I was flooded with a confusing mix of relief and a creeping sense of unease. How'd she manage to cover all that distance so quickly? Later that night, as I drove through the darkness, the incident gnawed at me. It didn't seem coincidental. Was I imagining things, or was there something a little off about Alara? The following morning, I awoke at a rest stop with a pounding headache and a lingering sense of dread. Every mile that ate up the asphalt seemed to bring me closer to something unsettling. It was early evening when I finally arrived at my destination, 
a distribution center near the California border. I was bone-tired and ready to crash for the night, but there was a backlog at the unloading dock that kept me waiting. I parked and climbed out of the cab to stretch my legs. Under the harsh fluorescent lights, I spotted a familiar blue coverall. It was Alara, leaning against a stack of crates. She looked exhausted, shadows etched beneath her eyes. When she saw me, that wide smile spread across her face. So we meet again, she said, voice light, almost teasing. It should have been a friendly greeting, but it set off every alarm bell in my head. My heart thrummed a steady beat of fear as she approached. Something was very wrong. I didn't know what, but an instinct deep in my gut screamed at me to run. Sorry, I blurted out, fumbling for an excuse. Gotta check something in the cab. I turned and walked toward my truck, my pace quickening. I could feel her eyes on me, her footsteps a silent pursuit. I scrambled into the cab and slammed the door, locking it just as her hand hit the handle. She peered through the window, her smile twisting into something else cold and calculating. Panic surged through me as I fumbled with the keys, my fingers clumsy against the ignition. My truck roared to life. She stood there in the rearview mirror, illuminated by my reversing lights. Her eyes locked onto mine, a flicker of rage replacing the vacant smile. For a split second, I saw it, not in her eyes, but behind them, a darkness that chilled me to the bone. I floored the gas pedal, leaving Alara a speck of dust-covered blue in the distance. I didn't stop driving until I crossed the state line. The next few days were a blur of sleepless nights, caffeine-fueled paranoia, and frantic glances in the rearview mirror. Any vehicle that remotely resembled a semi-truck sent my heart pounding a frantic tattoo against my ribs. Sleep, when it did come, was tormented by nightmares where Lara's face, twisted and malevolent, haunted my every step. That hitchhiker girl had burrowed under my skin, an infection of pure fear. I knew I couldn't keep running forever. My haul still needed to get delivered, bills needed to get paid, and besides, logic told me I was probably overreacting. But I decided to change up my route. Instead of cutting back across the southwest, I headed north from California, aiming to loop back east through Oregon and the Dakotas. It would add days to my journey, but the vast, empty spaces of the northern states felt like relative safety. I was wrong. My sense of security turned out to be an illusion, shattered one icy afternoon somewhere in Montana. I'd pulled into a truck stop for a refill, the frigid wind biting through me even as I pumped diesel. Just as I was about to head back inside, I froze. Parked in a far corner of the lot, half hidden behind a row of tankers, was a rig that made my blood run cold. It was an old freight liner, battered and faded, with a layer of grime that spoke of countless cross-country miles. But it wasn't the rig itself that sent shivers down my spine. It was the figure standing beside it. A tall, hulking man with a shock of dark hair and a beard that couldn't hide the sharp angle of his jaw. He was dressed in faded jeans and a stained denim jacket. A trucker, just like me. But when he turned and looked toward me, the jolt of recognition was undeniable. It was him, the man from the sketch. He didn't smile. Just stared at me with eyes as flat and cold as the winter sky. I felt the world tilt. This was no longer coincidence, no overactive imagination. I was being hunted, and from the way that hulking figure moved towards me, cat-like and calculated, I understood I was the prey. Scrambling back into my truck, I fumbled with the ignition. My rig sputtered into life. I slammed it into gear, tires spinning out on the icy lot. 
I didn't know where to go, only that I had to get away. He moved with startling speed for a big guy, easily keeping pace with the slow acceleration of my clumsy rig. I ran through a snowdrift, narrowly missing a baffled minivan, a terrified scream lost in the roar of my engine. The man was reaching for my door handle. Frantically, I threw the truck into reverse, barely avoiding crushing him against the concrete curb. I could see his face in the side mirror, contorted in fury. He wasn't giving up. My hand shook on the wheel as I wrenched the vehicle forward once again, a sense of hopeless desperation settling deep within me. What followed was a terrifying chase across the bleak Montana landscape. My semi wasn't built for speed or agility, but I pushed it, ignoring the protesting groans of the engine. The relentless man in the battered freight liner didn't fall far behind. I don't know how long it lasted, only that the world narrowed to the battered stretch of highway ahead, the icy wind whipping past my window, and the constant presence of my pursuer. It ended not with a bang, but a sickening lurch. A patch of black ice sent my rig careening out of control. The last thing I remember before the world dissolved into a chaotic swirl of snow and metal was the hulking man's face reflected in my windshield, a cruel mask of triumph. They found my wreckage a day later, overturned in a ravine. Me, I was lucky. Busted ribs, a fractured arm, a concussion that left my head ringing for weeks. But alive. The other trucker was never found. The cops chalked it up to him losing control on the ice, just another trucking accident. They never believed my story about the relentless pursuit, the man whose face was etched into my nightmares. I've never forgotten the look in those cold eyes. They told me a simple truth, some evils out there wear human faces. It took me months to get behind the wheel of a truck again. I still drive long hauls but something in me was irrevocably changed that day. I take fewer risks, trust far less, and I always, always watch my back. The news reports pop up from time to time. Unsolved disappearances, truckers going missing. Sometimes a body is found, sometimes not. Each time, a wave of icy dread washes over me. Because I know. Maybe they don't believe me, but I know what's out there, hunting those lonely stretches of open highway. And I pray I never cross its path again. My name is Jared, and this happened to me in the spring of 1992. I wasn't new to trucking then had a few years of long hauls already eating up the miles beneath my wheels. But that experience did nothing to prepare me for what would unfold on the highways of Nevada. It's funny how the mind clings to the most trivial of details when everything's about to go horribly wrong. I remember I was hauling a load of machine parts from Sacramento to Phoenix. I was behind schedule, pushing hard to make my deadline. I also remember being frustrated by a slow leak in one of the trailer tires. It meant an unplanned stop somewhere out in the middle of that desolate stretch of desert to patch the thing. It was just past dusk as I pulled off the I-80, the sky ablaze with purple and orange hues that seemed to stretch on forever. The truck stop was one of those old-school places, little more than a gas pump, a repair garage, and a dusty gravel lot. Not exactly inviting, but it would have to do. i just finished inspecting the leaky tire when a beat-up Chevy van rattled its way onto the lot. It parked a few spaces down, close enough that I could make out the mismatched body panels and the cracked windshield taped along one edge. I glanced at it out of habit, then went back to work. Moments later, the van door creaked open. My first thought was it was another driver checking the tire pressure before heading back on the road. 
but something prickled the back of my neck. I looked up and saw him. He was tall, easily six and a half feet, maybe more. The fading light made it hard to make out his features, but there was a leanness to him, a raw-boned kind of strength that had nothing to do with muscle bulk. He wore faded, patched-up jeans and a denim work shirt. His hair was dark and long, the bottom tangled up with a beard that looked like it hadn't seen a razor in months. What I remember most vividly about him were his eyes. Deep set beneath a heavy brow, they were an icy blue. But more than the color, it was the look in them that made me uneasy and unnerving stillness, like a predator locking onto its prey. He stood completely motionless, staring at me, not with any overt malice, but with a cold, analytical detachment that was more unsettling. My usual friendliness faded, replaced with a gnawing instinct to get as far away from this guy as I could. I grabbed my wrench, fumbling it in my nervous haste. Just fixing a flat. I muttered, my voice sounding too loud in the stillness. He didn't reply. He simply turned, climbed into the van, and drove off, disappearing into the thickening dusk. I watched him go, feeling a sense of relief so profound I almost laughed at my own foolishness. Yet, even as I told myself it was nothing, some primal part of me was screaming a silent warning. Over the next few hours, I kept seeing the Chevy van. At first, it seemed coincidental. I'd pass it pulled over on the side of the road, an unnervingly familiar shape amongst the countless other vehicles speeding past. Then I'd see it behind me in my rearview mirror, only to vanish when I turned my head to look. My rational mind fought to explain away each sighting. It was a common enough van, and this was the main artery through Nevada. Of course I'd see it more than once. But as night fell and fatigue gnawed at my brain, the logical explanations grew less convincing. I tried calling it in, trucker lingo warning others via CB radio about a potentially dangerous driver on the road. But something stopped me. Something about this didn't feel like a case of road rage, or even someone driving intoxicated. There was something calculated and intentional in the way the van kept appearing and disappearing. This wasn't a coincidence. It was a stalker. There's a particular type of fear that lives inside a trucker's soul. The fear of those desolate stretches of road. The vulnerability of an isolated rig breaking down with miles of emptiness all around. That fear was flooding through my system, fueled by the relentless presence of that Chevy van. I knew I could call the cops, but out here who knew how long it would take them to arrive. I was on my own. As midnight passed and the world blurred into the endless repetition of the white lines on the road, a plan started to form in my head. There was another truck stop ahead, a bigger place with a motel attached and usually a few truckers milling around even in the wee hours. Maybe if I could just get there. My knuckles ached from gripping the steering wheel too tightly, my eyes straining through the darkness. Every time those headlights flickered in the rearview mirror, my heart would take a sickening leap. He was playing with me now, appearing just close enough to keep the terror fresh. I swore I could feel those cold eyes fixated on me once more. When the neon sign announcing the truck stop finally pierced the darkness— a wave of relief so sharp it was almost painful washed over me. I visualized the plan like I'd done a thousand pre-trip inspections, pull in quickly, cut the engine, rush inside. With any luck, my stalker would lose me in the maze of parked rigs, or mistake mine for one already abandoned for the night. It was a desperate gamble, but it was the only shot I had. The exit for the truck stop loomed ahead. I eased off the gas, a surge of adrenaline both fueling me and making my hands tremble. The headlights in my rear view stayed a steady distance behind. 
So far, so good. I pulled into the vast lot, scanning for a spot closer to the entrance, but in a stroke of cruel luck, it was mostly empty tonight. I circled until I found a semi-half hidden behind a tanker truck. Not ideal, but it would have to do. I slammed on the brakes, throwing the rig into park even before it had come to a full stop. I tore open the door and scrambled down, every instinct screaming at me to run. The lights of the truck stop seemed agonizingly far away. Then I heard it, the distinctive rattle of that van's engine. He was somewhere close, just out of sight. Panic clawed at my throat. I broke into a sprint, my legs burning, chest heaving. Just as I reached the door, a blinding pair of headlights swung around one of the tankers, illuminating me like a cornered animal. The Chevy van. He'd cut me off. I stumbled backwards, the world tilting into a nightmarish blur. The van door opened. The tall figure stepped out, his silhouette cutting an imposing shadow against the harsh lights. There was nowhere left to run, no escape from the look in his eyes, that cold, predatory gleam. I fumbled for a weapon, anything. The wrench was still back in the cab, useless now. A wild notion of fighting back, using sheer surprise and desperation to my advantage, flared and died as quickly as it came. There was something almost inhuman in the stillness emanating from the man, some terrifying certainty that made resistance pointless. He started walking towards me, a slow, unhurried pace, like an executioner approaching the condemned. My mouth opened in a silent scream, my legs refusing to obey. I was trapped, not just physically, but by an overwhelming sense of inevitability. Somewhere in the distance, a voice yelled, another trucker arriving at the stop, unaware of the horror unfolding before him. A flicker of hope ignited in me. If I could just make a commotion. I found my voice, a hoarse yell tearing from my throat. Help! Somebody help! The tall man didn't break stride. He wasn't concerned, and in that terrifying realization I knew why. Here, in the vast emptiness of the desert night, no one would hear my cries. Then, just as despair threatened to sweep me away, I heard the truck. Not my own, but the growl of a powerful diesel engine. Headlights cut through the lot, and I saw a Peterbilt pulling up behind the Chevy van. My heart surged. Another trucker, a potential lifeline. But the hope imploded as quickly as it arrived. The trucker climbed out of his rig, not with the concerned haste of someone alerted to a cry for help, but with a lazy stretch and a yawn. Oblivious. This time, when I screamed, the sound was raw, a desperate animalistic sound stripped of all rationality. The trucker finally seemed to notice me, his expression shifting from sleepy confusion to alarm. The tall figure stopped a few feet in front of me. His movements were fluid, efficient, despite his large frame. There was a flash of something in his hand, a gleam of metal in the truck's stop lights. A length of rusty pipe. Then, the world narrowed down to that battered weapon raised in the air, the inevitability of its descent, and the sudden, ear-splitting roar of the Peterbilt's horn blaring directly behind him. The tall figure flinched, not in fear, but in surprise. It was just a split second, a disruption of his lethal rhythm, but it was enough. My survival instinct, dormant for too long, surged to life. I lunged to the side as that rusted pipe swung down, missing my head by inches. I stumbled, sprawling onto the dusty pavement, but I was already scrambling to my feet. The trucker from the Peterbilt was yelling, half confused, half outraged. The sudden commotion had disrupted the quiet of the night, thrown an unexpected wrench into the tall man's carefully orchestrated plan. 
He whirled on the trucker, his face twisting in a flash of fury. The man was fast, shockingly agile for his size, as he charged the unexpected obstacle. I stumbled backward, my pulse a frantic drumbeat in my ears. What happened next remains a blur of violence and noise. I remember the trucker, a burly guy named Hank, I learned later, fumbling with something by his belt. There was a flash of steel, a guttural roar, followed by the sharp crack of gunfire. The tall figure jerked, his body spasming uncontrollably. He looked at me then, his eyes wide with surprise, almost comical in contrast to the chilling stillness from before. There was a blooming stain of dark red on his denim shirt, spreading rapidly. The rusted pipe clattered to the ground, followed a moment later by him, his body collapsing with a heavy thud. I don't recall the moments that followed. My body moved on autopilot, my brain a shattered fragment of terror and disbelief. There were more shouts, other drivers emerging from their cabs. Someone called the cops. Someone else was checking Hank for injuries. There was a wail of sirens, and the whole world tilted into a swirl of flashing blue and red lights. The aftermath felt surreal. Weeks of statements, interrogations, being thrust under the harsh spotlight of investigation as both victim and witness. The incident didn't fit neatly into any box. It wasn't a simple road rage case. My description of the man, of his relentlessness, raised eyebrows and whispered suggestions I must be traumatized, overreacting. The cops did their due diligence, checked the van, ran the plates, dug into missing person databases. They found nothing. No identification on the man, no matching reports of anyone resembling his description. My stalker was a ghost, appearing from nowhere vanishing just as quickly, leaving only a trail of blood and unanswerable questions. But here's the thing about fear. It isn't logical, and it doesn't vanish just because the initial threat is gone. I never went back to long-haul trucking. The open road that was once my livelihood became a place of lurking shadows and endless stretches of vulnerability. Nightmares followed me, relentless as any highway filled with the phantom rattle of that Chevy van and the icy stare of its driver. I got a job driving deliveries in the city. Shorter routes, more people, the illusion of safety in numbers. But even on crowded city streets, I could never shake the feeling that I was being watched. Every tall stranger, every pair of eyes lingering a second too long, would send a sickening wave of adrenaline crashing through me. They called it PTSD, the doctors with their furrowed brows and concerned nods. Gave me some medication, told me to talk it out in therapy. But what kind of therapy helps when your therapist, with all their well-meaning advice, has never looked into the eyes of a relentless killer? Never felt the cold certainty that you are the hunted, and there is nowhere safe to hide? Years passed a slow blur of sleepless nights and relentless anxieties. The story of the trucker who killed the mysterious stalker on a lonely desert road became a kind of cautionary tale, whispered between drivers at greasy diners and fading truck stop bulletin boards. But I was never just a story. I was the one who lived it, who carries the scars invisible beneath my skin. My attacker may have been a ghost to the authorities, but to me, he remains terrifyingly real. One day, the cops told me, he might slip up, they might find a match, give him a name. I wait for that day, not with any hope for justice, but with a kind of grim satisfaction. To finally have a name to attach to the face in my nightmares, a concrete detail to ground the lingering horror. Some days, I almost envied the man who ended that night with a bullet. Ignorance of the lingering darkness would be a blessing. But Hank, with his gruff voice and kind eyes, he didn't save my life. 
He simply traded one kind of hell for another, a never-ending journey on a road paved with fear where the destination is forever out of reach. My name is Dalton, and this happened to me in the spring of 2014. I'd been a trucker for almost a decade by then, crisscrossing the country in my freightliner. I was married back then, had a daughter in elementary school. The long hours were rough, but the pay was decent, and I had that trucker's pride, that sense of being able to handle the highway, the solitude, and myself. Looking back, maybe I was a little too cocky, too sure of myself. It made what came after so much worse. I was hauling a load of electronics down from Oregon towards California. It was a smooth run at first, nothing out of the ordinary. The weather was clear, the roads weren't too congested, and I figured on making good time. I got a late start the night before so I was running a little behind schedule. That feeling of needing to push harder, shave a few hours off, sometimes that gets its hooks in you, and judgment flies out the window. It was just past midnight when I started noticing the pickup truck. It was one of those old, beat-up Ford models, faded blue paint, rust patches, and a cracked windshield. Had to be at least twenty years old. It materialized behind me out of the darkness, then hung back, keeping a steady distance. I figured some local driver trying to get home in a hurry, and didn't pay it much heed. But a few miles later, it was still there. That's when the first prickle of unease went down my spine. I tapped the brakes, subtly slowing down. The pickup reacted instantly mimicking my move to stay in its self-imposed position behind me. I tried speeding up, but it matched my pace with a stubborn precision. Now the unease was turning into suspicion. I reached for my CB radio, flipping through frequencies before calling out a warning to other travelers. Heads up, folks. Got a blue Ford pickup, might be driving impaired. Be wary if you see him. Only silence crackled back. No other driver responded. A chill ran through me. Maybe my CB was on the fritz. I tapped it, fiddled with the knobs. Nothing. Now there was outright fear mixing in with the adrenaline. I tried calling my wife on my cell, but there was no signal out here in the remote stretch of I-5. I was alone and whoever was driving that pickup knew it. I kept driving, pushing my engine harder, desperately hoping I could outdistance them. But the pickup clung to me like a leech. It was a terrifying game now me desperately trying to break free, and the predator in my rearview mirror matching my every move. The logical voice inside me screamed that this was beyond weird, that I should pull over and call the cops but something primal kept me going. Running seemed to hold a sliver more hope than being a helpless, sitting target at some desolate roadside. My exit for the next rest stop was coming up in about ten miles. My mind raced, trying to plan some kind of escape route, but it was hard to think straight with the roar of my engine and the frantic thudding of my heart all pounding in my ears. Just as the exit ramp became visible, the pickup made its move. It swerved suddenly towards my rig. I heard the squeal of tires, the sickening crunch of metal. The impact sent a jolt through my trailer, making it swerve wildly. I fought for control, knuckles wide on the steering wheel, barely managing to keep the massive rig from jackknifing. The pickup peeled off taking the exit ramp and disappearing once again into the velvety darkness. I pulled over, my whole body trembling as I inspected the damage. The side of my trailer was dented in, a long, angry gash marking the impact. But at least I could still drive. I didn't wait to make a police report, 
or explain to my dispatcher what went down. I got back on the highway, the image of the pickup burning into my retinas. I knew they'd be back. The question was when. And what the hell would they do next? I made it to the rest stop just as the first streaks of dawn began painting the horizon. The relief I felt was like a physical weight being lifted, and with it came a crushing wave of exhaustion. I knew I couldn't go on without sleep, but the thought of closing my eyes, of being vulnerable, was even more terrifying than staying awake. I compromised by grabbing a few hours of fitful sleep in the driver's seat, waking every time the slightest noise disturbed the parking lot. The sun was high in the sky by the time I pulled back onto the highway. It felt like the entire world had changed into some twisted hunting ground, and I was the prey. I called into my dispatcher, mumbling some excuse about a mechanical issue and a delay at the rest stop. I felt a surge of guilt at the lie, but I was beyond caring. I had to focus on getting to my destination alive. As the miles blurred under my wheels, dread gnawed away at me. Every car that passed, every truck that rumbled alongside, sent my pulse racing. I kept a constant eye on my mirrors, expecting to see that faded blue pickup reappear. I'd skin the passing roadside, my nerves screaming at me that they were out there, waiting for the opportune moment to attack again. The paranoia was all-consuming. There was no more rational thought, no plan, just the primal instinct to protect myself at all costs. I pulled off at a gas station, a dingy little place just outside of Bakersfield. My hands shook so badly I could barely operate the fuel nozzle. The gas station attendant, a wiry older guy with a faded tattoo on his arm, looked at me with a mix of concern and skepticism. You okay, buddy? You look like you've seen a ghost. I wanted to tell him everything, to plead for help. But how do you explain the relentless terror of a relentless stalker you've barely even seen? Before I could find the words, I heard the truck's engine, a deep, throaty growl that sent shockwaves through me even before the vehicle came into view. The pickup pulled up next to mine. The driver's side window rolled down revealing a man I'd never seen before. He was somewhere in his fifties, I guessed, with a thick shock of graying hair and a face creased by years of hard living. His eyes were a startling pale blue, cold and distant like ice chips. Those eyes stared straight at me, seeming to bore through my skull. Terror made me bold. I strode up to the pickup, forcing myself to meet his gaze. What the hell do you want? I yelled, my voice hoarse with fear and desperation. For a long, tense moment, the man simply stared, his expression unreadable. Then, a thin, cruel smile spread across his face. I just wanted to make sure you're okay, he said, his voice raspy, barely above a whisper. We had ourselves a little incident last night, didn't we? The cold realization that this was the man behind the relentless pursuit washed over me. My hands fisted. I wanted to lash out, to hurt him, but some part of me knew it would be like punching a phantom. He held all the power. The man must have seen the fear and the fury warring in my eyes. He chuckled, a dry, humorless sound. Better get back to your delivery, son drive safe, he said, a mocking lilt to his voice. And then he was gone, pulling away from the station, disappearing into the flow of traffic. I stood there, tremors running through me, and realized the horrible truth. They were letting me go. They could have forced me off the road, killed me, back there in the dark isolation of the highway. But they didn't. Instead, they'd made their presence known. Made sure I knew they were in control. It was a power play, a sick promise of more terror to come, and I had no way out. I somehow managed to finish the delivery, 
driving like a man possessed. My dispatcher demanded explanations, but I simply told him I'd quit. I left my rig where it was, hitched a ride to the nearest bus station, and went home to my wife and kid with a flimsy tale about needing a break. It's been years since that day, but the aftermath hasn't faded. I never got back behind the wheel of a truck. Turns out, some fears burrow too deep to overcome. Most days, my life seems normal enough. I work a warehouse job now, surrounded by people, by solid walls and regular hours. It's a small life compared to the freedom of the open road, but it's a life. Yet, every time I drive down an isolated stretch of highway, a shiver runs down my spine. Every old, faded blue pickup sends my pulse into overdrive. My wife thinks it's just anxieties, and maybe she's right. Maybe this is what happens when you cheat death. You walk around forever haunted by its shadow. I tried to find out who that man was, why they targeted me. Nothing turned up. It's like he never existed. I skin the news sometimes, half expecting to read about a trucker getting run off the road or disappearing without a trace. I both fear it and long for it, some proof that I wasn't crazy, that the evil out there has a name, even if I'll never know it. Some nights, the nightmares are still vivid. I'm behind the wheel, the roar of the engine my only company, and that relentless pickup filling my mirror. I wake up in a cold sweat, my wife stirring beside me, casting me a worried look I can't fully explain. There's a darkness I carry, a weight made of unseen threats and whispers from empty highways. And I know, deep down, it will never leave me. The hunter is out there, somewhere. And the only way this story ends is when they decide it's time. My name is Wes, and this happened to me in the fall of 2006. I'd been driving trucks since I left the military long hauls mainly, a mix of loneliness and a kind of mechanical freedom that suited me just fine. I had a wife in those years, Sarah, and we were hoping to start a family. The miles ate up my nights, but the paychecks bought us a little house in the suburbs, the promise of normalcy. I told myself it was worth it. I usually ran between the Midwest and the East Coast. This time, though, my route would take me down south, a load of textiles bound for a factory near Savannah. Weather was warm for October, the air thick with the last dregs of summer. I didn't mind the heat. Better than the icy blasts of a northern winter, any day. The first night on the road... I pulled into a truck stop somewhere in Tennessee. It was one of those independent places, not part of a big chain, run down and a little grimy but with decent food. I parked my Volvo rig in the massive lot filled with the hulking shapes of semis, grabbed my bag, and headed for the diner. Inside, it was the usual mix of road-weary drivers, grease-stained overalls, and weary waitresses dishing out coffee refills. I grabbed a stool at the empty counter and ordered a double cheeseburger. As I waited for my food, I noticed a figure out of the corner of my eye. At first, I assumed it was just another trucker, but something in the man's stillness, the way he held himself, made me take a closer look. He wasn't young, probably in his early sixties, I guessed. He had a weathered face with deeply etched lines, a thick head of salt and pepper hair, and the kind of faded denim jacket too worn to have been bought in recent memory. Yet, his eyes were startlingly vivid, a bright, icy blue that seemed strangely out of place on his aged face. He sat hunched over a coffee, nursing the mug, but not drinking from it. And he was staring at me, not in a threatening way but with an intensity that made my skin crawl. I looked away, 
busying myself with unfolding the crumpled napkin on the counter. But I could feel those eyes boring into me, an unnerving prickling sensation on the back of my neck. I fidgeted, my burger suddenly losing its appeal. Who was this guy? Maybe just some old drifter passing through, hitching rides from truck to truck. But something about the relentless intensity of his stare was off-putting. I finished my food quickly, paid the cashier, and all but ran back out to my truck. The parking lot lights cast long, distorted shadows. I scanned the lot, some primal instinct screaming at me to look for that solitary figure in the faded denim jacket and those unblinking eyes. He was nowhere to be seen. Relief flooded through me mingled with a jolt of self-mockery for being spooked by some old loner. I shrugged off the unease, climbed into my cab, and pulled out of the lot, merging into the relentless flow of the interstate. Yet, the image of his relentless stare lingered. That night, when I finally pulled over to catch a few hours of sleep, I double-checked that my doors were locked, the sense of vulnerability sharp and unsettling. In the morning, the light of day washed away the previous night's jitters. I passed it off as one of those random encounters that stick in your mind for reasons you can't fully explain. But then he reappeared. About two days later, at a rest stop along I-75. I couldn't believe it at first. The feeling was like some sort of waking nightmare deja vu. There he was leaning against a battered pickup truck in the far corner of the lot, those distinctive blue eyes watching my every move. Panic flared inside me, sharp as a fire alarm. Now, it was more than coincidence. This guy was following me. Questions hammered in my head. Why? Was he connected to the company? Some rival driver, trying to play mind games? He didn't look the part. Maybe he was one of those creeps preying on truckers. I didn't want to find out. I got back in my truck and took off, my heart pounding a desperate rhythm. There was a phone booth at the rest stop entrance, but the idea of stopping felt like inviting disaster. The cell phone reception out here was spotty at best. I drove for hours fear and adrenaline fueling my speed. I tried to figure out my next move, but my thoughts were a chaotic jumble. As daylight turned to dusk, I knew I'd have to stop for the night. I chose a big, well-lit truck stop on the outskirts of Atlanta. Maybe, just maybe, he'd lost my trail in the traffic. I could only hope. I pulled in as inconspicuously as possible parking at the far end of the lot, and spent the evening scanning the crowds around me, jumping at every flicker of faded blue. The following morning, I hit the road early. I avoided the main truck stop diner, instead grabbing a cold breakfast sandwich and a coffee from the convenience store before heading back on the highway. I kept glancing in my rearview mirror, half expecting to see him reappear, but the miles stretched on without incident. I began to relax, just a little. Maybe I'd managed to slip away from him during the Atlanta rush. By late afternoon, I was closing in on my destination. The relief washing over me was nearly overwhelming. That's when I saw him again. He was driving a nondescript gray sedan, cruising on the shoulder, seemingly waiting. The feeling wasn't relief this time, it was a sickening drop of dread. As I approached, he merged into traffic, maintaining a steady distance behind me. My exit was coming up in a few miles, and my mind raced, trying to plan some kind of escape route. Should I go off the route, try to get lost on side roads? Alert the company? The thought of calling Sarah filled me with an unexpected stab of guilt. How could I explain any of this to her without causing worry? I took my exit and he followed, mirroring my every turn. The factory and its attached warehouse loomed ahead. 
panic began to override logic. I couldn't lead him to the delivery point. But where else could I go? On a whim, I turned down a side road just before the factory. It was a narrow stretch, flanked by fields and a few scattered sheds storing what looked like farm equipment. I drove for about ten minutes, my heart thudding against my ribs. Finally, I approached a clearing and an abandoned-looking barn. This would have to do. I pulled my truck to a halt in the overgrown field and swung myself out the cab. He was nowhere in sight, likely blocked from view by a bend in the road. My escape plan was almost comically flawed, but I was beyond reason thinking. I bolted inside the barn, its interior dim and dusty. There were old bales of hay stacked against one wall. Desperation lent me a burst of frantic strength, and I started shoving them, creating a makeshift hiding spot. A clattering sound outside announced his arrival. I scrambled into the crude shelter and crouched down, pulling bales of hay to mask my presence. Through a gap in the rotting wood, I could see him. He had gotten out of his sedan and was walking towards the barn, those blue eyes scanning the landscape. My breath caught in my throat. It was only a matter of time before he came inside. He pushed the barn door open, and it creaked ominously. His shadow fell across the dirt floor as he stepped inside. He didn't walk far in, but stood just inside the threshold, as if sensing a change in the air. My heart pounded so hard I was sure he could hear it. I pressed myself further into my hiding spot. A long moment stretched out, pregnant with tension. He was so close I could smell the faint scent of stale tobacco and something like machine oil. Then he spoke, his voice a low rasp, surprisingly gentle for his rough appearance. "'Come on out, son!' We need to talk. The gentleness in his voice was more terrifying than any outright threat. It was the voice of a predator coaxing its prey. I knew right then that there was no escape. He knew I was here, and some terrifying instinct inside him took pleasure in the hunter's game he was playing. Look, I don't know who you are or what you want. I called out my voice hoarse. I shoved a bale of hay aside, emerging from my hiding spot. He didn't flinch, just met my eyes with that same icy stare. My name is Randall, he said simply. Your name, Wesley, right? A chill ran through me. He knew my name. How? I started to ask, but he cut me off. That doesn't matter now. What matters is you made a big mistake. A mistake that might cost someone their life. His voice was chillingly calm, sending a shiver down my spine. What are you talking about? I asked, dread and anger mixing inside me. About two weeks ago. Randall continued, ignoring my question. You were up north. A town in Pennsylvania. Don't recall the name now some little place off the highway. And you hit someone. My blood ran cold. Hit someone? There was no. I faltered, the memory slamming into me in a sickening flash, a dark stretch of back road, headlights cutting through the rain, a figure stumbling into my path. The thud, the sickening feeling that I'd hit something, or someone. Blind panic had seized me, and I'd kept driving, telling myself it had just been an animal, a deer maybe. The image of the figure crumpling against my windshield flashed, and I felt sick. He was drunk, maybe on something. Stumbled right in your path. But you didn't stop, Randall said, each word heavy with accusation. You left him there. Badly hurt, most like. Could be dead by now. I... I didn't know. I stammered, but even to my own ears, it sounded weak. Didn't know, didn't care. Randall's voice was harsh now, laced with contempt. 
He was my brother. The barn spun around me. It was so impossible, so unreal, that my brain refused to process it. Yet, looking at Randall, at those eyes that mirrored the same shade of blue as the figure in the rain-soaked darkness, I couldn't deny the truth. The realization brought on a crushing wave of guilt and self-loathing. I wanted to argue, to explain how terrified I'd been, but some essential part of me knew it wouldn't matter. A man was hurt, maybe even dead, and I was responsible. Randall had tracked me down to exact his own brutal kind of justice. What are you going to do? My voice sounded small, even to my own ears. Funny you should ask that. Randall reached into his pocket and pulled out a heavy-looking revolver. He leveled it at me, his hand disturbingly steady. I've been thinking about that myself. And I realized... A fair punishment is only fair, wouldn't you agree? I froze, unable to process the stark reality of the situation. Everything was happening too fast, the guilt, the revelation about his brother, the gun pointed at my chest. You left him on the side of the road. Randall continued, his tone flat. That's what I'll do to you. An eye for an eye, as they say. He walked towards me, his footsteps seeming to echo ominously in the barn's silence. I scrambled backwards until I hit the wall, panic seizing me. My eyes darted frantically around the barn, searching for an escape route, some weapon to defend myself. But there was nothing. I was trapped. He stopped a few feet away from me, that gun trained with lethal precision. Any last words? he asked, a mocking inflection in his voice. My mind raced, a desperate jumble of half-formed thoughts. I wanted to beg for mercy, to apologize, to somehow rewind time and undo the terrible events that led me here. But I knew it was useless. Randall wasn't interested in pleas or excuses. Instead, I closed my eyes a wave of resignation washing over me. In my mind, I saw Sarah's face. I saw the little house we bought, filled with half-formed dreams of a future that now would never be. Tell Sarah. I'm sorry. I choked out, my voice barely above a whisper. And then I waited for the gunshot that would end it all. The silence stretched out, a torturous beat followed by another. When nothing happened, I cracked open my eyelids. Randall was still there, weapon raised, but a flicker of something, hesitation, doubt maybe, seemed to have passed over his features. Then, as suddenly as he had appeared, he lowered the weapon with a sigh. Get out! His voice was surprisingly subdued, laced with a weary heaviness. Go on, before I change my damn mind! I couldn't believe it. A wave of hope pierced through the despair. But as I scrambled to my feet and rushed towards the exit, I heard the click of the hammer being raised once more. I spun back in time to see the gun pointed at me again. His eyes were no longer filled with cold fury, but with a deep, haunting sadness. And tell everyone you know what kind of monster you are, he said. That's your true punishment. Live with it. The gunshot echoed deafeningly inside the barn, but the bullet wasn't meant for me. I watched in horror as Randall raised the gun to his head and pulled the trigger. His body jerked, then slumped lifelessly to the dirt floor. I don't know how long I stood there, staring at his body. When I finally stumbled outside, the world seemed to tilt on its axis. I somehow managed to drive back to the highway, finding my way to a gas station where I called the police, my voice a hoarse whisper as I recounted the grim events. They came for me shortly after. The investigation, the questioning, the looks of disbelief mixed with pity, it all remains a blur in my memory. The news eventually reported it as a suicide, 
a grief-stricken brother unable to cope with the loss. No mention of the hit and run, no mention of the near-fatal retribution I narrowly escaped. The aftermath is a never-ending burden. I walk through life carrying the unseen weight of two deaths, the unknown figure on a Pennsylvania back road, and the man who collapsed in that desolate barn. I did turn myself in for the hit and run, received a lenient sentence with consideration taken for my extreme distress. But technicalities of the law don't absolve the guilt gnawing away at my soul. I never went back to long-haul trucking. I work in a warehouse now, same company, different job. I drive home every night to Sarah, whose concerned questions I deflect with half-truths and forced smiles. Our dream of a family died that day with Randall, replaced by unspoken anxieties and hollowed-out silences. Nightmares plague my sleep. Sometimes it's the rain-slicked road, the figure in my headlights. Other nights it's Randall, those icy eyes fixated not on revenge, but on a despair so vast it eclipsed his rage. I wake up in a cold sweat, Sarah stirring beside me, the unspoken questions hanging heavy in the darkness. Some might say I got away with it. But there are prisons far worse than barred cells and iron shackles. Mine is made of endless roads, unblinking blue eyes, and the knowledge that no matter how far I run, there is never a true escape. My name is Derek, and this happened to me in the spring of 2010. Back then, I was the definition of a long hauler, spending more nights in my truck than in my own bed. I liked the restless life, the ever-changing scenery. Besides, paid better than most jobs I was qualified for. That spring, I was on a regular run for the company. Nothing fancy, just hauling furniture from the Carolinas out to distributors on the West Coast. I was nearing the end of one particularly long leg, somewhere along the I-40 in New Mexico. It was late, the highway mostly deserted, just me and the glowing white lines for company. That kind of isolation can play tricks on the mind, so I was blasting the radio to fight the creeping fatigue. That's when I saw it, a hulking old Chevy pickup truck, the kind they don't make anymore, parked haphazardly on the shoulder a little ways up the road. My first thought was that someone was broken down. Maybe I should stop, offer a hand. But something about the unnatural stillness of the vehicle pricked at the back of my neck. I kept driving, but my eyes remained glued to the rearview mirror. As I passed, I caught a glimpse of the driver. It was a man, and even in the dim glow of my taillights, I could make out a few unsettling details. The thick shock of greasy black hair, the bushy beard and a pair of aviator sunglasses glinting in the darkness. He didn't turn towards me, but just kept staring straight ahead into the empty highway. A shiver ran through me. Maybe I was overtired, the isolation getting to me, but the whole scene had a wrongness that I couldn't shake. Miles turned into hours, and gradually, the image of the pickup faded from my mind replaced by the relentless rhythm of the road. However, around dawn, as I was pulling over at a rest stop in Arizona, I saw it again. The same beat-up Chevy, parked at the far end of the lot. He was sitting in the driver's seat, unmoving. The appearance of that truck two states away should have been impossible, but the sinking feeling in my gut told me it was very real. There was only one explanation— he had somehow gotten ahead of me. But how? And more importantly, why? I hesitated before going into the rest stop, considering just getting back on the highway, losing myself in the sprawling network of interstates. But I was running on fumes, and so was my rig. I refueled, trying to convince myself it was all a coincidence. Yet, 
When I went inside the rest stop diner, an uneasy prickling on my skin told me otherwise. He was there, sitting at a booth near the window, his gaze fixed on my truck outside. His mirrored sunglasses obscured his eyes, but I could sense his unwavering attention. I grabbed a coffee to go, paid the cashier without even glancing in his direction, and hurried back to my rig. Back on the highway, the fear gnawing at me propelled me to push harder. But I knew it was only a matter of time until he caught up again. Sure enough, the next time I pulled off for gas, there he was, parked two pumps away. This time, he emerged from his truck, a slow and chillingly deliberate movement. He was tall, easily six and a half feet, and lean in a wiry, unsettling way. His clothing was worn and faded jeans, a stained flannel shirt, and a battered leather jacket. But there was nothing vulnerable about his appearance. There was a predatory intensity in his movements, a controlled tension like a coiled snake. As he walked towards my truck, I fumbled for my phone. 911, what's your emergency? The operator's voice crackled through the speaker. There's this guy. I think he's following me, been tailing me for hours. I blurted out, trying to control the tremor in my voice. Can you describe him? His vehicle? I did, my eyes never leaving his form. He wasn't approaching yet, just standing a few feet from the truck, an unnerving silent presence. The operator told me to stay put, that help was being dispatched to my location. I tried to wait, to keep the terror at bay. But every time I turned my head, he'd moved a few steps closer, that same eerie, silent approach. Fear exploded into fight-or-flight instinct. I couldn't wait. I started the engine, slammed my rig into gear, and pulled out of the gas station, cutting across multiple lanes of traffic to re-enter the highway, the blare of angry horns trailing after me. Panic had over it in logic. The rest of the day passed in a blur of desperate speed and non-stop glances in my rearview mirror. I didn't see the Chevy, but the knowledge that it was out there somewhere, its driver patiently biding his time, filled me with a soul-deep dread I'd never known before. I tried changing my route, detouring from the main arteries of the interstate, but it was futile. By nightfall, exhaustion was starting to catch up to me, but I didn't dare stop. I took side roads, secondary highways, anything to avoid the predictability of the main routes. At one point, convinced I saw a flicker of those headlights gaining on me, I pulled into a cornfield, smashing through the young stalks, trying to lose him in the makeshift maze. It was desperation, pure and simple, and I knew it was pointless. Hours later, as the first streaks of dawn were starting to paint the horizon, a flicker of movement in my side mirror caught my eye. There he was, matching my speed, his headlights cutting through the twilight gloom. I took a sharp turn, trying in vain to shake him off as I swerved past a small town. I don't recall the exact moment the idea came to me, nor how my terror-fogged brain even formulated it. There was an old abandoned airfield just a few miles up the road, left over from World War II days or something like that. Maybe if I could get the truck in there, something about the desolate landing strips, the overgrown cracked tarmac, offered a sliver of hope in my desperation. The airfield was even worse than I remembered from passing by on previous runs. The gates were rusted and hanging half off their hinges. The guard shack was nothing but a crumbling ruin. But I rammed through, not caring about the damage it would inflict on my truck. Once on the tarmac, I veered off the main strip, driving wildly across the overgrown fields, hoping to throw him off if he followed. I saw his headlights swerve in response, the Chevy matching my move. This was madness, a desperate chase in the pale light of dawn. The old airfield wasn't that large, 
he'd find me eventually. I needed a hiding spot, something, and then I saw it, a half-collapsed hangar towards the edge of the old airfield. A gamble, nothing more, but it was the only chance I had. Swerving the massive truck towards the hangar, I braced myself for the impact. The rusted doors shuddered under the force but thankfully gave way, the truck lurching inside. I slammed on the brakes, dust swirling up in blinding clouds, my breath coming in ragged gasps. I waited. The sound of the Chevy's engine came from somewhere outside. He had stopped, but only for a moment. Then, the unmistakable crunch of tires on gravel, and the Chevy was moving towards the dilapidated hangar. I scrambled out of the truck and darted towards the back of the hangar, a pulse pounding in my temples. There was an opening in the rear wall, partially hidden behind overgrown weeds. I squeezed through, emerging on the other side into thick scrub that bordered the airfield. Maybe, just maybe, if I could lie low, I could make a break for it once he gave up searching. I crouched down, doing my best to control my ragged breathing. Through the gaps in the bushes, I saw the Chevy pull up in front of the hangar. The driver stepped out. My heart pounded sickeningly in my chest. He was walking towards the main entrance, those mirrored sunglasses reflecting the strengthening daylight. He entered the hangar, and the silence that followed fell deafening. Minutes ticked by with excruciating slowness. I could picture him in there, searching the vast, dust-filled space, his relentless footsteps echoing. Would he search the back on a hunch? Was my escape route about to be discovered? I didn't dare move, barely dared breathe. Then I heard it, the engine revving, the crunch of tires as he maneuvered the Chevy out of the hangar. And a moment later, the receding noise as he drove away. I don't know how long I waited there, crouched in the bushes, paralyzed by the knowledge of how close I had come to, to what, I still couldn't bring myself to think about in concrete terms. Slowly, as the sun climbed higher in the sky, I got to my feet, my movements stiff and trembling. The aftermath of that night is a muddled blur. I reported the incident to the state police. They searched the area, even questioned staff at a nearby diner where the Chevy had apparently been seen multiple times according to witnesses. The description I gave matched the truck, the man in the sunglasses, the eerie stillness. But they found nothing. It was like he vanished into thin air. I didn't go back to long-haul trucking after that. Got a local route instead, something with predictable hours, well-populated highways, a chance to sleep in my own bed each night. Because you see, even though they never found him, I know he's still out there. Sometimes, when a chill wind kicks up out of nowhere, or the sun glints off a pair of sunglasses in a passing car, I feel his eyes on me. A silent, relentless threat hanging in the air. It's funny, the things that stay with you. It's been over a decade, and even now, I avoid driving long stretches at night. I still check my mirrors every few minutes, half expecting to see that old Chevy lurking. Even my wife, bless her heart, jokes that I should get those mirrored sunglasses for myself, since I seem to be so fascinated by them. She doesn't get it can't understand the way my skin crawls every time I see a pair. See, the thing about fear is, it lingers long after the immediate danger passes. I may have escaped that night at the abandoned airfield, but he trapped me in a different kind of prison. One made of shadows, whispers in the wind, and the unshakable knowledge that darkness exists even in broad daylight— sometimes disguised behind a pair of aviator sunglasses. And there's no way of knowing where, or when, it might strike next.
My name is Ezekiel Barnes, and this happened to me back in the fall of 2008. I've been a long-haul trucker for most of my adult life. It's a tough job, lonely sometimes, but there's a certain freedom to it. You, your rig, and the wide open road, that's all a man needs, right? Well, that's what I used to think. Now, now I'm not so sure. See, the thing with long hauls is you end up in some out-of-the-way places, especially if you're chasing a tight deadline. On this particular run, I had a load of car parts one needed to deliver from Detroit all the way down to El Paso. It was a long trek, and after my initial push to get out of Michigan, I decided to break up the drive by taking a bit more of a scenic route. That's how I found myself driving along Route 61, cutting straight through the heart of Mississippi. The sun was dipping low, casting long shadows across the flat, humid landscape. It was cotton country, dotted with small towns and the occasional abandoned shack. As I rolled along, gnawing on a gas station hot dog and swigging back lukewarm coffee, I saw a sign for one of those towns— Waycross. Now, I'm not one for detours, usually. But something about the name, the way the setting sun made it shimmer in the distance, it drew me in. Figured I could grab a bite of decent food, maybe a shower and a bed for the night before getting back on the road. Waycross turned out to be one of those places that time seems to have passed by. Sleepy Main Street, a diner with faded neon and a dusty motel that looked straight out of the sixties. Perfect for a tired trucker, I told myself, even as a little voice in the back of my head whispered that maybe there was a reason this town was off the beaten path. The diner wasn't much to look at, but the smell of frying bacon and grits was enough to make my stomach growl in agreement. The place was mostly empty, save for an old guy hunched over the counter and a waitress who looked like she'd rather be anywhere else in the world. I slid into a booth, ordered a cheeseburger, and more coffee. So, just passing through? The waitress asked, her voice flat and a little suspicious. Yep, I took a swig of coffee. Long haul, Detroit to El Paso. She nodded her eyes flicking back towards the old guy, who was now staring out the window. He had the kind of face that looked carved from weathered wood, creases so deep you could hide a quarter in them. You best be careful round here, at night, he rasped, his voice surprisingly loud in the quiet diner. There are things out there you don't want to see. He turned his gaze to me, his eyes glinting in the dim light. I chuckled. I'm a big guy, sir. Not easily spooked. Besides, what are you gonna tell me? Ghosts? Swamp monsters? The old man didn't smile. He simply nodded once, then turned back to the window. The waitress shrugged at me, a flicker of something like pity in her eyes. I figured it was just small-town talk the kind meant to keep out-of-towners on their toes. With my belly full and a fresh pot of coffee at my table, I paid up and made my way back to the motel. The room was straight out of a crime flick, stained carpet, flickering lights, the faint scent of mold. But I wasn't picky. A shower and a bed were all I needed. I crashed on top of the scratchy bedspread, figuring I'd get a few hours of shut-eye before hitting the road again in the pre-dawn darkness. Sleep didn't come easy. Between the unfamiliar sounds of the old motel and the unsettling feeling that had crept over me at the diner, my mind raced. Finally, just as I was starting to drift off, I heard it. A scratching sound coming from the window. I sat bolt upright, my heart pounding. There it was again, a skittering noise like fingernails on glass. Now fully alert, I cautiously got up, inching toward the window. I peeked past the threadbare curtains. The parking lot was bathed in the anemic glow of flickering floodlights. 
It was empty except there was something crouching by my truck, half obscured in shadow. I couldn't make out a clear shape, but it looked big, and its movements were jerky and unnatural. My first instinct was to grab my phone, snap a picture. But something held me back. Every fiber of my being screamed at me that this wasn't something I wanted proof of. I watched, frozen in horror, as the thing reared up on what looked like impossibly long legs. Its head turned, revealing two glowing eyes fixed directly on my window. I stumbled backwards, tripping over my boots, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm against my ribs. That thing, whatever it was, knew I was here. Before I could regain my footing, the creature launched itself at my window. It hit the glass with a thud that reverberated through the entire room, leaving a web of cracks. It shrieked, a piercing, inhuman sound, and then, just as suddenly as it came, it was gone, disappearing into the darkness beyond the parking lot. Shaking, I backed away from the window, my eyes wide in a silent scream. There was no way I was sleeping here. No way I was staying in this godforsaken town a minute longer. I scrambled to throw my stuff into my duffel bag, my hands trembling. I was halfway out the door when I froze midstep. My truck. Taking a deep breath, I slowly approached the window again and peered out. The parking lot was still deserted, but my truck, my livelihood, it wasn't how I had left it. Deep gouges marred the hood, and the metal of the driver's side door warped outward like someone, or something, had tried to force its way in. There were scratches trailing across the roof, inhumanly long and ragged. I was breathing hard now, panic clawing at my throat. I didn't stop to consider the logistics, just grabbed my bag and bolted towards my truck, fumbling with the keys. I wrenched the door open, threw myself inside, and locked it, my whole body buzzing with terror. Slamming it in gear, I gunned the engine, gravel spitting up from beneath the tires, and roared out of that motel parking lot. I didn't look back. My name's Marcus Logan, and this happened to me back in the spring of 1997. I've been a trucker for longer than I care to admit, seen my share of this country from behind the wheel of an 18-wheeler. Pays decent, if you don't mind the loneliness, and my rigs become a second home. Never been married, no kids, so it suits me just fine. But after that night... Well, let's just say the open road lost a little bit of its charm. This particular run, I was hauling a load of electronics down from Seattle, bound for a warehouse in Phoenix. Usually, I try to stick to the main interstates, faster, smoother ride. But this time, I figured, why not switch things up a bit? Take a more scenic route, maybe cut through some of that stunning Idaho wilderness. It was a decision I'd come to regret. The first day's drive was uneventful, thankfully. I crossed the border into Idaho and found myself on a twisty Tulane lane highway, the kind that snakes its way through forgotten mountain towns and dense pine forests late afternoon. I pulled over at a truck stop diner, one of those faded relics that dot the back roads. Figured I'd grab a bite to eat and maybe catch a few winks before pressing on. The place was near empty, just me, the waitress, and a grizzled-looking old-timer nursing a cup of coffee at the counter. The waitress, a woman named Betty with tired eyes and a kind smile, took my order, asked the usual trucker questions. Where you headed? What's the haul? I made small talk tried to shake off the strange sense of unease that had crept over me as the sun had dipped below the mountains. You be careful out there, Betty said as she refilled my coffee. There's stories about these roads, especially at night. I raised an eyebrow. 
Like what? Bigfoot sightings? She shook her head, a worried look on her face. Worse than that. Folks gone missing out on this highway, truckers especially. Never a trace left behind. The old-timer chimed in, his voice raspy. It ain't just talk, son. There's something in those woods, something that don't like the passing of strangers. Now, I'm not superstitious by nature. But there was something in their voices, a sincerity that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I finished my meal, paid up, and went back to my truck, that unsettling feeling lingering. The sensible thing would have been to find a well-lit motel, hole up for the night. But I was already behind schedule, and the thought of losing more time irritated me. Besides, what were the odds of anything bad actually happening? I climbed into my rig, fired up the engine, and rolled back onto the highway. Night fell quickly in the mountains. The headlights cut a narrow path through the darkness, the trees looming like monstrous shadows on either side of the road. I turned the radio off, the silence amplifying the low rumble of the engine and the creaks and groans of the cab. My mind started playing tricks on me. Every rustle in the woods, every flicker of movement at the edge of my vision, it sent chills down my spine. Then, just as the tension was starting to get unbearable, I saw it. Up ahead, a figure standing in the middle of the road. I slammed on the brakes, the truck lurching violently, my heart pounding. It was tall, too tall for a man and stooped with incredibly long limbs. As I got closer, the headlights washed over it, revealing skin stretched tight over bone, like pale, wrinkled leather. But the worst part were the eyes. They glowed in the darkness, twin pinpricks of malevolent light. For one terrifying moment, the creature and I locked eyes. Then, with a screech that tore through the night, it launched itself into the woods, disappearing into the blackness. Shaking, I threw the truck in gear and sped off, not daring to look in the rearview mirror. I drove for what felt like hours, my mind racing. What the hell had I just seen? Some kind of animal? A deformed person? My rational brain struggled to make sense of it, but deep down, I knew there was no logical explanation. Finally, as dawn began to creep over the horizon, I spotted the flickering neon sign of a roadside motel. I pulled in, barely able to control my trembling hands. Even the rundown room, smelling faintly of mildew and stale smoke, felt like a sanctuary. I stripped off my clothes and fell into the lumpy bed, but sleep wouldn't come. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw that creature— its inhuman form burned into my memory. I lay there, staring at the cracked ceiling, until the rising sun cast a faint glow through the dirty curtains. Gathering my things, I stumbled back to my truck. I had to get out of there, put as many miles as possible between myself and that stretch of haunted highway. Before I pulled out, I went to find Betty the waitress, needing some kind of reassurance an explanation, anything. But when I stepped into the diner, it was empty. Equipment sat abandoned, a half-eaten sandwich on the counter. A cold chill washed over me. I hurried back outside, climbed into my rig, and tore out of that forgotten place. Driving south, my mind couldn't shake the image of the deserted diner. I tried to convince myself Betty and the old-timer had simply packed up and left some time in the night. But a terrible thought nagged at the back of my mind. What if there was another explanation? What if they weren't the first to vanish on that desolate road, and wouldn't be the last? I stopped once for gas and a stale cup of gas station coffee. I tried to strike up a conversation with the cashier a young kid with a bad haircut and a vacant stare. When I asked him about the diner a few miles back, he just shrugged. Ain't no diner round these parts. 
he droned, popping his gum. Never has been. I stood there, stunned. My mouth moved, but no words came out. The kid's words hung in the air like a death sentence. I paid for my gas, went back to my truck, and sat there for a long time, trying to process what he'd said. Was this an elaborate prank? Some kind of mass hallucination? I looked down at my hands, still shaking slightly. The memory of those burning eyes in the darkness was too vivid, too real to be dismissed. With a heavy sigh, I knew what I had to do. I couldn't just drive away, forget what I'd seen. Whatever that thing was out there, it posed a threat. People were disappearing, and it was only a matter of time before more vanished, more truckers like me. I flipped open my phone, hands fumbling with the unfamiliar touchscreen, found the number for the Idaho State Police, and dialed. The call took an eternity to connect. When a gruff voice finally answered, I launched into my story, my voice hoarse with urgency. The dispatcher sounded skeptical at first, and who could blame him? My tale must have sounded like the ramblings of a sleep-deprived man-man. But as I described the creature, its inhuman features, the glowing eyes, something in his tone shifted. All right, sir, calm down, he said, his voice now edged with concern. We've had reports of unusual sightings in that area. Stay put, and I'll alert the nearest responders. Relief washed over me, quickly followed by a fresh wave of panic. How long would it take help to arrive? And what would a couple of small-town cops do against something like that? I didn't have long to wait. The wail of sirens reached my ears, growing louder with each passing moment. Two state trooper cars screeched into the gas station parking lot, tires squealing. A pair of officers... A man and a woman, both young and broad-shouldered, jumped out. I approached them cautiously, suddenly aware of how wild I must look, unshaven and wide-eyed. They listened intently as I recounted my story, their faces a mixture of concern and disbelief. When I finished, the female officer looked at her partner. You thinking what I'm thinking, Jim? He nodded grimly. Sounds a hell of a lot like the Miller case, doesn't it? I perked up. Miller? There was someone else, then? The male officer, Jim, shot me a pitying look. A couple, John and Sarah Miller, drove a camper van down from Montana last fall, heading to Vegas for their anniversary. Never made it. Van was found abandoned on the side of the highway, smashed to hell like something big tore into it. No sign of the Millers, not a trace. Horror washed over me. So, I wasn't the only one. That thing had been out there, hunting, for who knew how long. We gotta warn people, I said, my voice urgent. Close down that road, evacuate the towns. Get the National Guard involved, whatever it takes. The female officer shook her head sadly. It ain't that simple, sir. We tried that after the Millers. Sent search parties, helicopters, the works. Found nothing, no tracks, no evidence, nothing that would justify the resources. She paused, then continued. Truth is, most folks up top think it's a hoax, a local legend to spook tourists. They won't act unless we have proof, something concrete. Frustration and anger swelled within me. So we just let people disappear? Let that creature keep hunting? Jim gave me a sympathetic look. Look, we ain't dismissing you. But you gotta understand our hands are tied. We'll look into it, patrol the area more, but without hard evidence. He trailed off unable to finish the thought. I knew he was right. They were cops, bound by protocol and the need for tangible proof. But I'd seen that thing, 
looked into its soulless eyes. I knew the evil that lurked out there. It made me sick to think of it taking more innocent lives. I gave the troopers a description of the diner location, and they promised to check it out as part of their increased patrols. Deep down, I knew it was futile. The diner, Betty, the old-timer, they likely never existed, just phantoms conjured by that desolate place, or perhaps by something even darker. I thank the officers, the words feeling hollow. They climbed back into their cruisers and drove away, leaving me alone with my chilling knowledge. It was nearly noon by the time I pulled myself together enough to continue the drive. I stuck to the interstate, the wide lanes and steady stream of traffic offering a semblance of safety. But the image of that creature was seared into my mind, its presence a shadow that clung to me. In the days and weeks that followed, I tried to go back to my old life, to pretend like what I saw was just a bad dream. But it was impossible. Every rustle in the night, every strange shape glimpsed out of the corner of my eye, sent shivers of terror down my spine. I started carrying a gun, a desperate measure that offered little comfort. I searched the internet obsessively, looking for any mention of similar sightings, any hint that I wasn't alone in this madness. There were whispers, fragments of stories scattered across message boards and local news sites, tales of missing hunters, abandoned vehicles, and strange sightings deep in the woods. Enough to convince me that this was more than just the isolated incidents, but nothing concrete enough to convince the authorities. The breaking point came a few months later. I was at a truck stop in Nevada, grabbing a lukewarm coffee, when the news was on the TV above the bar. A young reporter, her face grim, was talking about a string of disappearances along a rural stretch of highway in Idaho. My blood ran cold. It was the same stretch of road where I had my encounter. They showed pictures of the victims, a middle-aged hiker, a family of four, and another trucker, a burly guy with a booming laugh who I used to see at rest stops. A wave of nausea washed over me. I stumbled outside, gasping for air, the world tilting around me. I knew then it was over. My life as I knew it was over. Haunted by guilt and terror, I quit my job, sold my truck, and drifted from place to place, never staying anywhere for long. I avoid back roads, travel mostly by bus or train, always looking over my shoulder, forever on the run from the monster in the darkness. My name is Dale Tucker, and this happened to me back in the fall of 2012. Been driving rigs longer than I like to think about, crisscrossing this country more times than I can count. It's a lonely life, but it's all I know. Pays decent, I'm my own boss most of the time, and there's a certain peace to be found at night, just you, the hum of the engine, and the endless stretch of asphalt. At least, there used to be. This particular route was new to me, hauling a shipment of industrial machinery from a port in Oregon down to Los Angeles. Company wanted to save on fuel costs, so instead of the interstate the whole way, they had me charting a course through some backcountry roads. I wasn't thrilled. Mountain passes, winding switchbacks, not my favorite terrain, especially in a rig this size. But hey, a job's a job. First day went smooth enough. Weather was decent, traffic light, and the scenery in those parts of Oregon, breathtaking. Emerald forests, snow-capped peaks, the kind of stuff they put on postcards. Made me think maybe this trip wouldn't be so bad after all. Nightfall brought a change. Fog rolled in thick and fast, the kind that clings and swirls, making your headlights useless. I slowed to a crawl, nerves on edge. 
these roads weren't built for an 18-wheeler. Every curve was a blind gamble, and my gut twisted with each groaning shift of my cargo. Then, just when I thought it couldn't get more treacherous, my engine started sputtering. Damn thing coughed and wheezed, threatening to die altogether. I swore, pulling over to the narrow shoulder. The fog pressed in around me, obscuring everything more than a few feet away. I popped the hood, cursing my bad luck. With my limited knowledge and even more limited tools, I was unlikely to fix whatever the problem was out here. Cell service was non-existent, of course. I was starting to weigh my options, start walking and pray for a passing car, or try to wait out the fog until morning, when I heard it, a rustling sound from the trees. I froze, the hairs on the back of my neck prickling. This wasn't animal noises, too heavy, too deliberate. With trembling hands I reached for the hunting rifle I kept stashed under the seat. Just a precaution, I'd always told myself. Never had to use it before. The rustling stopped, replaced by an eerie silence. Every instinct screamed at me to get back in the rig, drive the hell out of there, broken engine or not. But something held me back. I crept towards the edge of the road, rifle raised, peering into the swirling fog. That's when I saw them, two eyes, glowing faintly in the mist, and possibly high off the ground. My breath hitched. In the split second before the creature lunged from the fog, I caught a glimpse of its form, hulking, skeletal, inhumanly long legs supporting a torso that was all sinewy muscle and taut, corpse-gray skin. I fired, a desperate reaction, the rifle bucking against my shoulder. The creature shrieked, a bone-chilling sound that pierced the night, and then it was gone, swallowed by the fog. Shaking, I stumbled back to the truck, slammed the door, and locked it. I huddled there, rifle clutched in my white-knuckled hands, waiting for it to attack again. But the only sounds were the pounding of my heart and the drip of condensation inside the cab. Finally, as dawn broke, casting a weak light that barely penetrated the fog, I worked up the courage to peek outside. There was no sign of the creature, not even tracks, despite the muddy ground. I started the engine, praying for it to catch. To my mingled terror and relief, it sputtered to life. I put that stretch of Oregon and that godforsaken creature in my rearview mirror as fast as I could. But though I managed to deliver the shipment, battered rig, busted nerves and all, I didn't tell a soul what happened. Told the dispatcher I'd hit a patch of black ice, explained the mechanical trouble. They grumbled, docked my pay, but I didn't care. Who would believe the truth anyway? Time didn't do much to dull the memory, like I'd hoped. The image of those burning eyes, that inhuman shape, haunted me. I started drinking too much, sleeping too little, always jumping at shadows. Then, a few months later, the news reports started cropping up. Local papers, small-town websites, all telling fragmented stories of strange disappearances, slaughtered livestock, and sightings of some monstrous figure lurking in the wilderness of the Pacific Northwest. My blood ran cold. It wasn't just me. That thing was out there, hunting. I tried to warn people. Posted online, in those fringe message boards where folks talk about aliens and cryptids and stuff no sane person takes seriously. I tried calling the cops, but all I got were skeptical chuckles and suggestions for a psych evaluation. The gnawing guilt kept me up at night. They dismissed me as a drunk a crank, but I know what I saw. People were going to die, and it would be my fault. That's what prompted the last-ditch effort. I couldn't let more folks get hurt without doing everything in my power to stop it. I quit my job, drained my savings to buy equipment, night-vision gear, a better rifle, 
a battered old van repainted in camouflage. Then I parked myself near one of those rural towns reporting sightings. The waiting game began. I spent my nights patrolling isolated backroads, scanning the darkness, heart pounding like a war drum with every flicker of movement. For weeks, there was nothing but eerie silence and the growing certainty that I was losing my mind. But then, then it happened again. It was a moonless night, the air heavy with the promise of rain. I was about ready to pack it in, chalk it up to another dead end, when I saw movement near the tree line. That same hulking shape, those impossibly long limbs. My breath caught in my throat, but this time, I was ready. I reached for the rifle, flicked off the safety. That thing was stalking something, or someone. In the dim glow of my night vision, I made out a figure huddled near some bushes, a camper, or maybe a lost hiker. The creature tensed, muscles rippling beneath its skin, preparing to pounce. I aimed, squeezed the trigger, and the night shattered with the blast of the rifle. I fired again and again until my ears rang, until the creature let out a piercing cry and disappeared into the inky blackness of the woods. I don't know if I hit it. In the confusion, amidst the echoes of gunfire and the panicked rustling of the undergrowth, I couldn't be sure. What I do know for certain is that I saved that person out there that night, whoever they were. They scrambled away into the darkness probably scared senseless, but alive. The adrenaline coursed through me, a mixture of exhilaration and sick dread. I had faced the monster again, and I had survived. But there was no feeling of victory. I stumbled back to the van, hands shaking violently. I knew this wasn't over, not by a long shot. I'd fired a gun in the dead of night, near a town already abuzz with talk of a mysterious creature. It was only a matter of time before the police showed up. Sure enough, the flashing blue lights pierced the darkness before dawn. I didn't resist when they hauled me in, a trembling mess, muttering about a monster in the woods. The local sheriff, a grizzled man named Cooper with eyes that had seen too much, locked me in a cell, alternating between bewilderment and barely concealed pity. My wild story, told in panicked bursts, made me sound delusional, even to my own ears. The next day, however, things took a turn. A search party ventured into the woods where I'd had my encounter, led by a reluctant Sheriff Cooper. I didn't hold out much hope. Whatever I'd shot at was long gone and physical evidence out in the wilderness is fleeting at best. Yet, when Cooper returned, there was a grim look on his face that made my stomach churn. They didn't find any bodies, human or otherwise. But they found something else. Tracks, unlike any animal he'd ever encountered. Enormous, misshapen footprints pressed deep into the mud. And there was something else something that sent chills down Cooper's spine and turned what little color I had left to ash. They found blood. Not a lot, just a few spatters on the leaves, the kind an injured creature might leave behind. Cooper didn't arrest me. Instead, he released me with a long, considering look and a cryptic warning. Best you steer clear of these parts. Some things ain't meant for men to understand. I took his advice, ran like hell and never looked back. The months that followed were a nightmare. I was branded a local lunatic, the crazy trucker who saw monsters. Lost what few friends I had, couldn't hold down a job, the haunted look in my eyes scaring off potential employers. Sleep became an impossible luxury, every creaking floorboard the sound of approaching clawed feet every flicker of shadow the creature lurking in the darkness. Desperate, I spent my dwindling cash-seeing therapists, hoping to be diagnosed with some kind of trauma-induced psychosis, anything that might offer a path towards normalcy. 
They poked and prodded at my fragile mind, filled me with pills that did little to dull the terror that clung to my soul. But I knew the truth, horrible and undeniable. My shattered sanity was the only sane response to an insane reality. Then came the news reports. It started with missing livestock again, animals torn apart with brutal, inexplicable force. Sightings filtered through the media, a blurry photograph from a hiker's phone, a terrified eyewitness report on the local news. And eventually, the disappearances began again. A lone hunter vanished in the woods, leaving no trace but a half-eaten backpack. A lone fisherman's boat was found abandoned on a remote lake, a smear of blood on the side the only clue to his horrible fate. The familiar pattern, the one I'd witnessed the beginning of, made the bitter truth crystal clear. My warning shouts had heard it, maybe even injured it seriously. But that creature, that monstrous thing, hadn't died out there. I hadn't stopped it. With a surge of gut-wrenching nausea, I realized something else. My desperate attempt to protect others had done the very opposite. Instead of driving it away, I'd merely driven it deeper into the shadows. That's when the nightmares truly began. They weren't just fragmented flashes of the creature's form or echoes of its bone-chilling shriek anymore. They were vivid, excruciating visions of the victims, of their final moments of terror as they were hunted, cornered, and torn apart by something out of humanity's darkest imaginings. I'd wake up screaming, soaked in sweat, guilt and horror twisting my insides. I knew then that there would be no escape from this, not for me, and not for the people living in the shadow of that beast. News of the killing stopped reaching me. I drifted from place to place, a ghost haunting the highways I once ruled, a shell of the man I used to be. I tried disappearing entirely, odd jobs under assumed names, sleeping in homeless shelters, blending into the forgotten corners of society. But it wouldn't leave me alone. Sometimes, in the dead of night, as I lay shivering on a filthy cot, I'd swear I could hear its ragged breathing, smell the sickly sweet scent of its rotting flesh just outside the window. It was toying with me, I realized, letting me know it was still out there, still hunting. Folks say insanity is doing the same thing repeatedly and expecting different results. Maybe they're right. I'm back on the road behind the wheel of a beat-up old truck, another faceless drifter trying to make a living. But the cargo I haul now isn't machinery or electronics. The battered van that's both my transport and my home is filled with a different kind of arsenal. Every back road I travel, every isolated stretch of highway, I search. I search for the creature and for the courage to face it again to end this nightmare once and for all, even if it costs me my life. My name's Marcus, and this happened to me back in September of 2012. I was hauling a load of electronics down from Oregon to Southern California. Nothing special, just another run on the I-5, the usual blur of asphalt and caffeine. Been a trucker since I left the army like the travel, the open road. Not glamorous, but it suited me. I always preferred night shifts, less traffic, a cooler drive. I was rolling under a clear desert sky by the time I hit the Nevada border. There's something about that stretch of highway— a kind of lonely beauty to it. Stark mountains, miles of sagebrush, a sky so wide you can almost feel the curve of the earth. Tonight, that isolation had a different flavor, though. An uneasy prickle at the back of my neck. It wasn't the first time I'd felt that. You learn to trust your gut on the road, especially after dark. I eased off the gas a little, put on some classic rock to try and shake the feeling off. Didn't help. 
By the time I neared Tonopa, those mountains to the east were looking less picturesque and more, well, looming. The radio reception was getting spotty, flickering between stations with bursts of static. I flipped it off, the silence pressing in. That's when I spotted the hitchhiker. Now, picking up hitchhikers isn't exactly company policy. And let's be honest, the guys you see on the side of the road in the dead of night usually aren't the type you invite into your cab. But there was something about this one that felt different. He was just a figure huddled by a highway sign, barely visible in the glow of my headlights. No backpack, no odd props, just a man standing very still. My gut, that same one that had been churning all night— actually eased a little at the sight of him. Like, hey, at least I'm not alone in this creepy emptiness anymore. Big mistake. As I pulled up to the shoulder, the first thing I registered was the smell. Not like body odor, not that kind of human funk. Something worse, metallic and rotten, almost like spoiled meat left out in the sun. I tried to ignore it, opened the passenger door, and leaned out. Need a lift? The hitchhiker turned towards me, and the dim light of the dashboard illuminated his face. Or what was left of it. What I saw wasn't a face, exactly. More like a torn-up mess of skin, flesh hanging in flaps, revealing bone and sinew underneath. One I was missing entirely, the socket a gaping black hole. The other stared out at me, wide and feral. He didn't answer my question, just let out a low, rasping growl that didn't sound entirely human. That smell got stronger, and I finally pinpointed the source of bundle wrapped in stained canvas, held tightly in his arms. My gut wasn't just uneasy now, it was screaming at me. This wasn't a hitchhiker. It was something else entirely. Sorry, buddy, I'm full up. I slammed the door shut and shifted into gear. Gravel sprayed as my tires hit the asphalt. I risked a look in the rearview mirror. The figure was unnaturally still, a silhouette in the darkness. And even from a distance, I could see that one baleful eye was fixed on me. I pushed the rig faster, the speedometer creeping past the legal limit. That rotting smell seemed to cling to the inside of the cab, and the skin on my arms started to crawl. Up ahead, a sign announced the next rest area was only twenty miles away. Maybe I could hole up there, wait for daylight. My headlights swept across the road, and caught something darting across the asphalt, a hunched, loping figure. For one panicked moment, I thought it was my hitchhiker— but this creature was even more grotesque. Furless, hairless skin stretched taut across a skeletal frame. It looked half-starved, desperate. Then it turned towards the truck, and I saw its face. Or, more accurately, its jaw, distended and filled with rows of needle-like teeth. This wasn't a lone hitchhiker. I had stumbled into a whole other kind of territory— a place where things that should only exist in nightmares prowled the desert. I glanced again in the rear view. The road behind was empty. Whatever that creature was, it had retreated into the shadows. But up ahead, more movement flickered at the edge of the headlight beams. Another than another. Pale, emaciated shapes, all converging on the truck. A pack— the rest area was starting to feel less like a safe haven and more like a trap. There was nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. These things, they weren't natural. I wasn't even sure they were alive in the way we understand it. Then I saw it, a glimmer of hope. A few miles further down the highway, there was an exit, a dirt road disappearing into the scrub. It was a gamble, but at this point— Anything was better than staying on the main road, waiting for those creatures to surround me. I swerved the truck, kicking up a cloud of dust as I left the asphalt. It was a rough ride, 
sagebrush scraping against the trailer, but I didn't slow down. I had no idea where the dirt road led, but it had to be better than what was behind me. The truck jolted along the bumpy road, and I glanced nervously in the mirrors. The shapes were still there for a while, eerie silhouettes against the horizon, but eventually they faded into the darkness. Either they'd given up or were waiting further ahead, hoping to catch me by surprise. I kept the gas pedal pressed down, the engine roaring in defiance. I had no idea how long I drove. Fear kept me going, fear of what lay behind. Miles turned into a blur of sagebrush and rock. The dirt road narrowed, winding through dry gullies. I didn't care. Get off the main highway. Get somewhere those creatures wouldn't look. That was all that mattered. Finally, the land flattened out a little, and up ahead, I saw a flicker of light. A building, maybe? A ranch, an outpost, any sign of civilization. I pressed on, hope surging through my veins for the first time since I spotted that hitchhiker. As I got closer, disappointment clawed at my gut. It wasn't a ranch. It looked more like a dilapidated shack, cobbled together from old lumber and rusted metal sheets. A single yellow light flickered in the window. Still, there was no way I was driving another inch into the desert night. This was it, my only chance. I pulled the truck to a stop outside the shack, cut the engine, and the sudden silence was deafening. The silence of the desert at night isn't the same as silence in a town or a suburb. It feels heavy, like the world itself is holding its breath. I took a shaky gulp of air, grabbed a flashlight and a tire iron from under the seat, and stepped outside. As I approached the shack, that same rotting smell hit me, the same foul stench that had clung to the hitchhiker. My heart pounded in my chest. This place seemed just as wrong as everything else out here tonight. But I didn't have a choice. I had to find out if anyone was inside, if there was a phone, or maybe even another vehicle I could take. I reached the flimsy wooden door the tire iron raised and ready. Taking a deep breath, I pushed the door open. It creaked on rusted hinges, the sound echoing into the darkness. The stench was worse in here, almost overwhelming, mixed with the acrid tang of gasoline. I flicked on the flashlight, the beam cutting into the gloom. What I saw made me freeze. It wasn't a room. It was a slaughterhouse. Blood splatter covered the walls, the dirt floor a mess of dark stains. Old tools butchers' knives, bone saws hung from hooks. And there, under the harsh glare of the lone light bulb, was a half-finished feast. Carcass remnants, animal? Human? I couldn't tell, were scattered across a rough table. But I wasn't alone. A figure crouched nearby hunched over a pile of raw meat, tearing into it with shocking ferocity. At first, I thought it was another one of those hairless beasts I'd encountered on the road, but as it lurched to its feet I saw the tattered remains of clothing, the hunched posture that was unmistakably human. He was no different than the hitchhiker, his face a mask of ravaged flesh, his one remaining eye burning with madness and he was staring right at me. I didn't think, just reacted. Swung the tire iron blindly, more out of desperation than hope. It connected with a sickening thud, and he let out a roar that was part pain, part animalistic rage. He scrambled towards me, faster than I thought he could move. I swung again, but he was relentless. I stumbled back, my foot catching on something, and I tumbled to the dirt floor. The flashlight skittered away, plunging me into darkness. Rough hands found me, ripped the tire iron from my grasp. I kicked out wildly, heard a pained grunt, but his grip was like iron. 
Then I heard a strange hissing sound and smelled gas sharp and choking. A moment later, the mad hermit was outlined in a burst of orange as he struck a match. The world erupted in flame. I scrambled to my feet, blind panic giving me a surge of strength. I pushed through a burst of heat towards the open door, towards the promise of the cool desert air. Behind me, the shack roared into an inferno. I could just make out the man's burning silhouette, writhing in agony, before the roof collapsed in a shower of fiery sparks. I stumbled out into the night, my heart pounding a desperate tattoo against my ribs. As the adrenaline faded, pain bloomed. My arm burned where he'd grabbed me. A sharp throb in my side suggested cracked ribs. I stumbled to the truck, fumbled the keys into the ignition, and hit the gas. It took hours before I hit a paved road again. An hour after that, I finally saw a flashing sign announcing a gas station and diner. I pulled in, my legs shaking so badly I could barely stand. I don't remember much about talking to the cops, the paramedics, or the investigators that swarmed the area later. Just the shock, the hollow feeling in my chest that wasn't going to go away any time soon. They found the wreckage of my truck in the desert, picked clean to the bone. Nobody ever found the dirt road, the shack, or any sign of the creatures I encountered that night. Officially, it was considered a hit and run. They figured I ran into a trucker, got into a fight, they panicked and torched the rig. A nice, clean explanation to file away in a dusty folder. Me, I don't drive the Nevada stretch anymore. I took a desk job with the company, dispatching other drivers who have no idea the kind of darkness I saw out there, the kind of darkness that could swallow a man whole. Sometimes, I dream about that burning shack, about the ravaged face of the man who lived there, his burning stare fixed on me. They say truth is stranger than fiction. After that night, I know one truth for sure, the real monsters, they aren't always hiding in the shadows. Sometimes, they walk right alongside us in the harsh light of day. My name is Caden, and this happened to me back in the fall of 2006. I'd been driving long haul for a good five years by then. Divorced, no kids, so there wasn't much keeping me tied down. The open road, yeah, it gets lonely, but it can also be freeing. That particular stretch, I was hauling a load of furniture from North Carolina up to New York. The Blue Ridge Parkway is supposed to be beautiful, especially in autumn. They weren't kidding about the blue part. Those mountains seemed to melt into the horizon, a hazy, layered tapestry of blues and purples. The crisp air, that sharp smell of leaves starting to turn, should have been a good run. Except I never made it to New York. The trouble started just outside of Asheville. There was a detour sign flashing up ahead some road construction scheduled way past normal working hours. Nothing to do but take the alternate route, a winding county road that cut through the mountains instead of the usual stretch of interstate. It added hours, but I figured better late than never. Night fell while I was still deep in the hills, the headlights cutting through thick fog that rolled in thick and sudden. I'd barely seen another car since I'd turned off, the forest looming close on either side of the two-lane road. That's when the first animal darted out, a deer, a blur of white tail disappearing back into the trees. I slammed the brakes, the rig lurching to a halt. Heart still pounding, I got out, flashlight in hand, to check for damage. Just as well I did. The fog muffled sound and I would have missed it if I hadn't been right up next to the truck. But there it was a ragged rip in the tarp covering the back of the trailer. Something had clawed its way in. 
My hands shook a little as I secured the makeshift patch the best I could and forced myself back into the driver's seat. Whatever had done that, it was probably long gone now, spooked by the truck. Or so I told myself. The logical, rational part of my brain was being drowned out by a rising sense of unease. The radio was dead, nothing but static and snatches of old gospel songs coming through the speakers. I switched it off, the silence pressing in. Up ahead, a flicker of light cut through the fog. A gas station, maybe? A diner? Please let it be a diner. I was starving, and the thought of a greasy burger and strong coffee had suddenly become incredibly appealing. But what I found as I got closer wasn't what I expected. It was a house, more of a cabin really, a ramshackle place with faded paint and a sagging porch. A single dim bulb burned on the porch, casting an uneven circle of light that barely broke through the gloom. Still, I saw lights on inside. I pulled up, killed the engine, and got out slowly every instinct screaming at me to get back in the truck and drive. But there was the ragged hole in my trailer, the cargo I had a responsibility to deliver, and my rumbling stomach. The place looked deserted, but the front door was slightly ajar. Maybe this was one of those places in the middle of nowhere where everyone knows each other, the kind where they don't bother locking up. I approached cautiously, calling out a tentative, Hello? The door creaked further open. My heart sank. I didn't like the looks of this, liked it even less when a foul odor wafted out into the cool night air, something sickly sweet and rotten, like meat left out in the sun for too long. Anybody home? I tried again, my voice a little more forceful. The hairs on my arms started to prickle. I should have gone with my gut, turned around and found a place to sleep in the truck till morning. But some stubborn part of me insisted on playing this out. I was a grown man, after all, not easily spooked. With flashlight raised, I stepped through the doorway, bracing myself for whatever was waiting inside. The first thing that hit me was the heat. It was stifling in there, even with the front door open. The second... Well, that was worse. The source of the stench became clear the minute the light beam swept across the far wall. Blood was smeared floor to ceiling, dark, dried-out smears, fresh spatters, and there. Bone. A pile of them in the corner, stripped clean. Animal bones, mostly, but there were a couple that looked a little too big. A little too human. And in the center of it all, a man. At first, all I could see was his back. Broad, hunched shoulders straining against the tattered fabric of a dirty t-shirt. He was focused on something in front of him, something on the floor. He made a snuffling sound, an eager, wet noise that made the skin on the back of my neck crawl. That's when he turned. The human mind isn't meant to process some sights. This was one of them. His face, what was left of it, wasn't the face of a man anymore. It was a raw, glistening mess. The nose was gone entirely, the cheeks ripped away, the lips drawn back in a snarl that exposed rows of jagged teeth. His eyes, one milky and blind, the other fixed on me with a terrible intensity. A low, guttural growl rumbled in his throat, a sound less human than beast. I didn't wait for him to attack. I turned and ran, stumbled through the open door, the night air suddenly freezing on my sweat-slick skin. I fumbled the keys into the ignition, started the engine, and the truck lunged forward before I'd even gotten the door closed. Gravel flew as I sped back towards the main road. I risked one glance in the rearview mirror. The porch light illuminated his monstrous form as he stood framed in the doorway, watching me go. For one insane moment, I almost expected him to sprint after the truck on all fours. 
but he didn't. Just stood there, silhouetted against the light, as the cabin grew smaller and smaller, swallowed by the fog and trees. The rest of that night was a blur. I drove without stopping until I reached the interstate. I finally pulled into a rest area just after sunrise. My whole body was shaking, my stomach churning. I must have thrown up half a dozen times. Even knowing I was miles away from that cabin, I couldn't shake the feeling of those eyes on my back. Had it been real? Some hallucination brought on by exhaustion and hunger? No. I'd seen what I'd seen. And whatever that thing was, I had a nasty feeling it wasn't alone out there. The police, well, that was an exercise in frustration. Sleepy small-town cops don't take kindly to truckers with wild stories about cannibal monsters in the woods. There was a perfunctory search, an officer taking down my report, but I could tell they didn't believe me. Figured I'd gotten into a fight with someone, torched my own rig, cooked up some crazy story to cover it up. My trucking company wasn't any more supportive. They took one look at the damaged trailer, heard enough of my rambling report, and promptly fired me. Insurance wouldn't cover the ruined cargo, let alone a new trailer. Within a week, I was jobless, my rig impounded, facing a lawsuit from the company for negligence. Desperate, I tried to investigate on my own. There were vague accounts of missing hikers, unsolved disappearances in state parks near where I'd been that night, but nothing conclusive. Locals gave me the stink eye. Outsiders aren't welcome in isolated towns, especially not the kind who start asking questions about strange happenings. Meanwhile, the nightmares wouldn't stop. That cabin, the gore-splattered room, the creature's hungry eyes. I jolt awake in a cold sweat, convinced that it was standing right there in the shadows of my crappy motel room. Started keeping a hunting knife under the pillow, figured it couldn't hurt. I tried to put it all behind me, find another job, something that wouldn't put me alone on deserted highways at night. It didn't work. Every time I got behind the wheel of a car, I felt that same crawling dread. The memory of those mountains, of the fog and that single light in the darkness, haunted me. It wasn't long before the drinking started. It was the only thing that could numb the fear, push the images back for a few hours. Didn't take long to cross the line from coping mechanism to full-blown addiction. I lost what little I had left. My car, the motel room, what was left of my sanity. A few months after that night in the mountains, I woke up behind a dumpster, a filthy blanket wrapped around me, my body aching from booze and withdrawal. The sky above was that same relentless blue it had been on the Blue Ridge Parkway. The sight of it snapped something inside me. I stumbled to a nearby payphone, the few coins in my pocket jingling with each unsteady step. Called my old army buddy, the one who had sworn a hundred times he'd always have my back. Begged him to take me in, mumbled something about needing a place to dry out, to get my head on straight. He didn't ask questions, bless him. Just gave me the address and the bus fare to get there. It's been ten years since I walked away from the wreckage of my old life. Ten years living off the grid in a little cabin in the New Mexico desert. My buddy, Jake, he's got a small ranch out there. Does odd jobs, keeps a few cattle, stays out of trouble. I work alongside him, keep to myself. The nightmares haven't entirely gone away, but they've faded a little. Out here... Under the vast desert sky, the darkness holds different horrors, but they feel older, less personal somehow. During the day, there's enough honest work to keep the demons at bay. At night, the bottle still calls to me sometimes. But there's also Jake, with his quiet patience and the unwavering belief that some wounds just need time to heal. 
and he's got a shotgun propped up next to the back door, just in case. I try not to think of how close I came to being another forgotten missing person's case, a ripped-up pile of bones on some monster's floor. Sometimes, on the darkest nights, I still catch a whiff of that rotten sweet smell on the desert wind, and a shiver runs through me. I check that the windows are bolted, that the shotgun is loaded. Folks say the mountains never forget what they've seen. Neither do I. I see those eyes, that blind, hungry stare, every time I close my own. Some scars, they run deeper than flesh and bone. Some kinds of darkness, once you let them in, they become a part of who you are. You don't get to outrun them. All you can do is find a patch of light, and hope it's enough to keep the shadows at bay. My name's Dylan, and this happened to me back in September of 2014. I was a long-haul trucker then, pulling freight up and down the East Coast. Married for a few years by then, a little girl. Most nights, after I got her to sleep, my wife and I would settle on the couch, watch some mindless TV. That kind of routine sounds simple, but when you're on the road more than you're at home, it's the little things that matter. This particular run, I was hauling a load of industrial parts from Georgia down to Miami. Florida in September, you know the drill. Hot, humid, the usual afternoon thunderstorms threatening to flood the interstate. I was pushing my hours hard, trying to make the delivery deadline. Figured some extra cash in the bank would smooth things over if I was a little late getting home. Took a shortcut on the last leg, a stretch of state highway that cut through the Everglades instead of going around. Now, I've seen gators out there before, but this felt different. The scrubland was denser coming close to the water, shadows longer even though it was only mid-afternoon. Had to slow the rig down on account of the road being rough, the thick vegetation closing in on both sides. The whole place felt closed off. That's when I saw the hitchhiker. He was standing a little ways off the road, a lone figure in the middle of all that swamp and scrub. Something about the way he held himself, a kind of stillness, made me hesitate. Usually, I don't pick up hitchhikers. Company policy, for one, and there's something unsettling about a guy standing alone out in that kind of desolation to begin with. But I also remembered my own restless younger days, thumb out on the highway hoping for a ride. Figured the least I could do was stop, offer him some water or something, let him know the nearest town with a gas station was about fifty miles north. As I drew closer, though, I got a sinking feeling in my gut. Up close, this guy didn't look right. Skin the color of old paper, eyes sunken deep into his skull. His clothes were filthy, and I swear, even in the sweltering heat, I smelled a kind of cold rot clinging to him. My hand was on the gear shift to pull away, but before I could, the passenger door creaked open. The hitchhiker slid into the cab, the smell of decay filling the space like a wave crashing over me. Thanks for the lift, he rasped his voice a dry whisper that seemed to come from the back of his throat. He didn't look at me, just stared straight ahead out the windshield, his gaze fixed on the road with a strange intensity. Well, uh, you're welcome, I replied, my voice sounding distant in my own ears. Listen, I'm going south, but the next town is a good ways back north. Need me to turn around? He didn't answer which was starting to get on my nerves. I looked over at him again, trying to catch his eye. It was hard to make out details in the dim light filtering through the trees, but what I saw sent a shiver of pure dread down my spine. His head was still turned slightly away, but the corner of his mouth curled up into a smile, 
a smile that split his face almost too wide for a human mouth. And in the gloom, his eyes, they glowed with a dull yellow light. A jolt of adrenaline surged through me. I slammed my foot onto the gas, the truck lurching forward. In the rearview mirror, he just sat there, that smile still plastered on his face. But now he was looking straight back at me. That's when the screaming started. Not coming from the radio, not some animal call. It was coming from the back of the trailer, high-pitched and desperate. Panic and nausea twisted in my gut. Something was in there with me. Something alive. I hit the brakes, throwing gravel, skidding to a stop in the middle of the road. Heart pounding, I stumbled out of the cab and ran to the back of the trailer. Hands trembling, I fumbled for the padlock, threw the doors open. Darkness rushed out, and that smell, the same rotting stench intensified a hundredfold. And there, crouched in the corner of the shadowy space, was a figure. No, not a figure, a ragged scarecrow of a boy, maybe ten years old. His thin frame was barely covered by torn clothes, his eyes wide with terror. Blood covered his face, smeared across his trembling hands. He made a choked, sobbing sound, and then the words came out in a ragged whisper. Help me, please! There was a sudden thud from inside the cab. The boy flinched violently, terror shining in his tear-filled eyes. Get out of there, kid! Run! I shouted, scrambling to pull the hunting rifle I kept under the seat out from its case. The boy started to crawl towards the open doors. I turned just in time to see my hitchhiker heave himself out of the passenger seat. He wasn't walking now, but loping on all fours, limbs moving in a jerky, unnatural rhythm. Closing fast. I raised the rifle but my hands were shaking so badly I could barely manage to aim. The creature charged, a blur of tattered clothing and yellow eyes hungry with feral intent. I fired. The gunshot echoed in the sudden stillness. The creature jerked back, the impact throwing it to one side. Then, it slowly rose, a ragged hole in its shoulder, dripping a thick, dark liquid. It raised itself to its full height, and I finally saw it clearly. Too tall, limbs stretched and elongated, with joints that bent at the wrong angles. Its face, the shot had torn away part of the jaw, revealing rows of needle-like teeth. Another shot echoed from the back of the trailer. The creature convulsed, then went limp. I rushed to the back, the boy huddled next to the open doors, the rifle shaking in his hands. He turned those terror-filled eyes on me, whispering, Did you, did you get him? We stared at the creature's unmoving body. My mind whirled. It couldn't be alive, could it? I lunged for the rifle, but the boy, showing a flash of courage surprising for someone so young and traumatized, pushed it away. No, he shouted his voice cracking with desperation. They come back, they always. It's the only way to stop them for good. With a strength born from sheer panic, he grabbed a gas canister from behind the pile of crates I hadn't noticed earlier. He doused the creature's body, the acrid smell sharp in the humid air. Fire, he muttered. That's the only way. He fumbled in his pocket coming up with a crumpled pack of matches. Struck one, and the flame flickered in the twilight. I didn't try to stop him. Some primal part of me understood what he was saying. This thing, it wasn't like anything I'd ever encountered. It wasn't human, at least not anymore. I helped him drag it out onto the dirt road. With a shaking hand, he lit the match and dropped it. Fire roared, consuming the monstrosity in a burst of flames. Thick, oily smoke billowed into the darkening sky. We stood there, side by side, 
watching the body burn until nothing was left but blackened ash and bone. Then and only then did I turn my full attention to the boy. He was trembling, his face white as a sheet. He slumped against the trailer, the rifle falling from his numb fingers. I crouched beside him, gently retrieving the gun. My mind raced. What had he witnessed? How long had he been trapped with the creature? I didn't know his story, but I knew, with bone-deep certainty, that whatever darkness had turned that man into a monster had touched this boy as well. What's your name, kid? I asked, my voice softer now. Ethan, he whispered, his eyes looking through me more than at me. Ethan, I repeated, you're safe now. I'm going to get you some help, okay? He didn't respond, only stared out into the gathering darkness of the swamp, into the place where that thing had come from. When the police arrived, the story I told them was barely half the truth. Some things you just can't explain. Hit-and-run victim, carjacker, feral meth addict. Take your pick of half-believable scenarios. The cops looked at me with a mix of skepticism and pity, but I held my ground. Ethan didn't say much, mostly just nodded when they asked if my version of events was true. They took him to a hospital, promised to find someone from child services to look after him. Maybe there was some family out there, a life he could go back to. I doubted it, though. The look in his eyes told me he was carrying scars far deeper than any the doctors could mend. I finished my delivery, but my heart wasn't in it. The road, usually a comfort, now felt like a prison. All I could see was that swamp, the decaying face of the hitchhiker, the boy's terrified eyes. I called my wife, made some excuse about a breakdown needing extra time. When I did make it home, her worried face broke my heart. They fired me a week later, said I was unreliable, a safety hazard. Didn't bother explaining, let them think I'd cracked under the pressure. The money from that last run bought us some time, but not much. The bills piled up. My wife kept that threadbare smile and didn't ask too many questions, but I saw the worry creasing her brow got myself a job in a warehouse, unloading trucks. Pays nowhere close to what I used to earn, but it keeps the lights on. Every night, though, the dreams return. The road stretching into darkness, the hitchhiker's yellow eyes, the crackle of flames. Sometimes, I dream about Ethan. I never found out what happened to him. Part of me is afraid to. Sometimes, I see families unloading groceries in the supermarket parking lot, laughing kids climbing into minivans. And a small, selfish part of me feels grateful that my worst nightmare stayed in the swamp that day. The other part, the part that looks in the mirror and sees those same haunted eyes Ethan had, knows better. They say if you stare long enough into the abyss, it stares back. I guess a part of me stayed back there with that burning body, out on that desolate stretch of highway that cuts through the heart of the Florida Everglades. Some days, I hear the rustle of those swamp reeds in the wind whispering through the warehouse stacks, and I smell that sickly sweet rot. They never found others like the hitchhiker, at least not officially, but I know they're out there. The ones who slip through the cracks— who take their monstrous hunger and disguise it with human skin. That's the darkness I brought home with me from that swamp, the darkness that lurks under my skin now, whispering a terrible truth. Sometimes the scariest monsters don't have claws or glowing eyes. Sometimes they look just like us, and they walk among us unseen. My name's Marcus, and this happened to me back in the fall of 2008. Had a pretty regular life then, driving a local delivery route for a grocery chain. 
wife, two young kids, dog, the whole suburban deal. It wasn't exciting, but hey, it paid the bills and kept the family fed. It was late one Friday night, pushing midnight as I pulled up to the warehouse to drop off my last load. Usually, this place was bustling, but tonight it was dead quiet. Nobody at the loading docks, nobody answering the night bell. Didn't smell right, but I figured maybe I was earlier than scheduled, mix up with dispatch, whatever. Got out to take a look around back, maybe rouse whoever was manning the night shift. Then I saw them, the blood streaks. Started near the loading dock doors, dragging across the cracked asphalt, like someone had hauled something big and messy inside. Then there were the spatters, bigger spots spread out. Something terrible had happened here. That's when the instinct kicked in. Maybe it was years of watching too many cop shows, maybe just a basic survival sense, but I knew I shouldn't be there. I backed slowly to the truck, adrenaline spiking, hands shaking as I tried to key in the security code on the keypad to open the cab. Too slow. Movement flickered in the shadows next to the warehouse. Before I could react, a figure bolted out into the dim light cast by the old security floodlights. Tall, gaunt, a blur of dark clothes against the night. He was moving fast, but I got a good enough look at his face to make my blood turn to ice. Skin stretched taut across bone, his skull almost visible beneath. Eyes sunk deep in their sockets, shining with a sick, hungry light. And his smile that twisted, jagged stretch of his mouth was all teeth, way too many for a human jaw. He was on me in a flash. I managed to get in the truck, slam the door, and lock it just as he reached the driver's side. He hit the glass with a thud, the impact cracking the window. I fumbled to start the truck hands slick with sweat. He clawed at the door handle, snarling. Yeah, it was more snarl than a human sound. Engine roared to life, and I shifted into reverse, tires spinning and kicking up gravel as I backed away from the loading dock. In the rearview mirror, the gaunt figure stood silhouetted by the warehouse lights, blood smeared on his hands, that awful grin fixed on his face. I drove all the way home with my heart pounding a frantic rhythm against my ribs, the headlights slicing through the darkness like a blade. I finally pulled up outside my house, but my hands wouldn't stop trembling enough to get the keys into the lock. I couldn't go inside, not yet. I thought of my wife, kids asleep upstairs, if that thing came after me. That's when I saw the police cruiser parked down the street. Relief flooded through me, but then a new kind of fear took hold. What if they didn't believe me? What if they thought I had something to do with whatever went down at the warehouse? Swallowing hard, I forced myself to walk over to the cruiser. Knocked on the window, trying not to let my voice betray my panic. The officer rolled down the window, squinting at me through the drizzle that had started to fall. Can I help you, sir? I blurted it out then, the whole story, the warehouse, the bloodstains, the, the creature. He listened without interruption, his face unreadable beneath his hat. When I was done, he didn't laugh or call me crazy, which was honestly what I expected. Instead, he nodded and told me to wait there. I watched him walk slowly towards my house saw the porch light come on as he knocked on the door. An eternity passed, my heart hammering so hard I thought it might burst. Finally, my wife opened the door. They talked for a long time, her face tight with worry. The officer came back ten minutes later, his expression grim. You need to come with us, Mr. Reynolds. They didn't cuff me. Turns out, they'd already found the bodies at the warehouse. Torn apart, half-eaten, exactly like I'd feared. My description of that thing 
lined up with what the crime scene techs were calling in. Unknown animal attack. But some of the younger cops, I noticed they looked at me differently after my story. Spent the weekend in a cell, answering the same questions over and over. Finally, my alibi checked out. Security cam footage at a gas station. Time stamped to confirm I was nowhere near the warehouse at the time of the attack. Released, but not cleared. I went home, but it didn't feel like home anymore. My wife, bless her, tried to make it normal again, but I could see the fear in her eyes. The kids, they sensed the tension, the way things had changed even if they didn't understand why. The news said it was a wild animal, maybe a rabid bear or something, but I know what I saw. They never found the body what was left of it anyway. Some nights, I dream of that hungry grin, the glint of those inhuman eyes. I didn't drive for the grocery company again after that. Got a job at a call center. Pays nowhere near what it was, but it's indoors, well lit, safer. Sometimes, though, I catch a glimpse of myself in the computer monitor, sunken cheeks, haunted eyes, and I realize I'm becoming something like that creature myself. Not the bloodthirsty part, at least, I hope not. But something's changed inside me. Some darkness got in that night. I keep telling myself it was sleep deprivation, adrenaline, some trick of the light that made him look the way he did. But those teeth, that smile, they weren't tricks. I saw a real-life monster, and that monster changed me. Maybe the worst part is knowing they're still out there hiding in the shadows, waiting for their next victim. And there's not a damn thing I can do about it.